I just thought that tearing open with all those layers and the weird flower looking thing. Yeah. I just being like, that is so disturbing looking. Well, and you know what the flower thing was? It was tongues, dog tongues oh, with little right. teeth on that's it. That's right. That's right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. I'm your host, Chet Czar. Happy New Year. It's 2024. Can't believe we made it through that horrible hell year. It was 2023. And uh, I have high hopes for 2024. I don't know about you, but things are already looking up as far as I'm concerned. At least uh, in my personal life, it seems like it's off to a good start. Uh, so in order to start the new year off right, I thought I would have my friend Ryan Peterson, the amazing sculptor, artist, really a genius, and um, also a he has a great taste in horror movies. And we both are huge fans of John Carpenter's The Thing, so we're going to talk about John Carpenter's The Thing. And, you know, we have, uh, Betty, I got a, I got a visitor here. Come here, Betty, come here, jump up, jump up, come on, jump up. This is Betty. If you're watching the video, she's very cute. Um, this is my kid's dog. Um, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, I think we have, we may have a, a slightly different take on the thing, not different, uh, nuanced, maybe more nuanced because we both worked in makeup effects for a long time and we see effects differently than most people because we know how they're done. And uh, uh, Ryan also worked with Rob Bottin, uh, not on the thing, but on some, some other projects. And Rob Bottin did the effects for the thing and the effects are, you know, kind of the star of the show and the thing. But the acting's great. It's such a great film. It's just great. So we're going to talk about that anyway. Um, yeah, what's new with me is that <laughs> I have this dog here. Uh, I just, you know, I took my break. I tried not to work for two weeks. I, you know, I worked a little bit here and there, but it was a, a much more relaxed pace. So I feel kind of recharged and ready to go uh, for, for the new year. Um I think that's yeah nothing that exciting. I uh, uh oh I my I I'm well okay. Let's let's say this. Uh let me say the Patreon thing first. If you want to support this podcast and if you aren't already, please do. It's only a dollar a month. It's super cheap and I know a lot of people listen to this podcast and we definitely don't have the same numbers on our Patreon as we do have listeners. So, if you can afford a buck a month. It's greatly appreciated. This is how the podcast gets done. Otherwise I couldn't afford to do it. Um, and if you join at the $5 and above level, you get a coupon code for skull shop. S K U L L S H O P P E. Here's one of their skulls. Amazing skulls. And it's wearing this beanie. I'm, I'm, I got these beanies. Uh, uh, I had some beanies made. This is glow in the dark, this logo glow in the dark thread. It's pretty cool. And, uh, I sold out of the ones that I had and I'm just placed another order. So in another couple of weeks, they're going to be available on uh, chetzar.bigcartel.com. And if I could sell enough of those, I want to get some, uh, dark art society beanies made too with the dark art society logo. That'd be pretty cool. Anyway. Um, that's that. Uh, if you want to support my work, you can go to patreon.com slash Chet And again, for only a dollar a month, you can support me and see what I'm up to. Uh, I think that's it. I got a lot of stuff coming up. I've, I didn't get all of my, you know how last year I said I was going to get all my commissions done. I took the year off of a solo show. Well, I got a lot of them done. So it's just going to spill over a little bit into this year. So I feel pretty good about that. I didn't get them done, but I got a lot of them done and I'm 
working on them now um, throughout January. I've got a show coming up in February, the LA Art Show. I'm going to show a piece. So I got to make a new piece for that. And then I have a solo show coming up at Copro in October. And uh, that's October 12th. We just set the date for that. So um, I'm going to be working on my solo show the rest of the year. And I got some really cool pieces um, I'm designing right now. I think that's it. Let's get on with it. Uh, here we go. Yeah, we're going to talk about the thing. Here we go. Ryan Peterson talking about the thing. Hope you enjoy it. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Ryan. Well, thank you. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's it's starting off pretty good for me so far. Oh, good. So that's good. Good. And, the, and um, Lisa, Fritz, everyone's doing okay? Yeah. Yeah, everyone's doing good. I got, um, as was featured in the in intro, I've got a dog in here. This little chihuahua. Come here, Betty. Come here. Come here. Come here. So hopefully she won't be too annoying. I've got two cats here that'll probably want to jump on my lap at some point. So it's okay. <laughs> hey, stop it. Come on. She's weird. She's really weird. She's really cute. <laughs> Hold on. Come here. Come here. Get, get over here. Oh, you're killing me. Come here. Come here. Come Can here. I see her? Yeah, I'm trying to get her. Can you sit with me? Oh, hey, sweetie. <laughs> oh, how long have you had her? This is, it's my kid's dog. Or him. It's a is she. It a it's she? Her, her name's Betty. And, uh. Oh, hey, Betty. I don't know how long they've had her. Probably less than a year. She's oh. very sweet, but she's very, tries to pick on the pit bull and. Oh, <laughs> you know, she's like those little obnoxious dogs, but she's so sweet. Oh. And she weighs nothing. It's so weird. She doesn't make any sound when she walks around the house. Like the other dogs, you can hear them walking. <laughs> and she just, you don't never know where when she's underfoot. Um, oh. <laughs> so, <sweet. laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Um, how have you been? Rough holiday yeah. for you? Uh, a little. Yeah. A little. I, but uh, everyone's been, the, the last episode we did with Ryan Case, we were talking about just like, 2023 was such a hell year for so many people like everybody oh, yeah. i know you know went had something going on yeah yeah but that, that is the case i mean really everyone has something going on it just was weird and it was like one of those years yeah i agree but I, i'm hanging in there good yeah, so, okay good well we were going to talk about the thing this was our idea Talk about John Carpenter's The Thing, um, like we like we did uh, The Exorcist. So this is almost like becoming a little feature on the show, where we talk about cool movies. Yeah. If if we uh, if if people like it, we keep doing it. There's tons of movie, other movies we could talk about if you want to do it. But um, absolutely, I know uh, you're a huge fan of The Thing, like I am, and. Uh, did you, uh, did you, did you see it when you, I'm sure you saw it when it came out in the theater. I did. Yeah. It was amazing, yeah. right? <laughs> no. Okay. So did you see it in the theater? Yeah. Did yeah. You? I loved it too. I just thought it was amazing. And it's like John Carpenter, I, I've been watching some interviews in, in preparation for this. And he was saying like critics hated it, which I do remember critics hating it. Cause I, I remember watching the reviews on uh, like Siskel and Ebert and stuff and they mm -hmm. just were just panning it. And, but he was saying that fans hated it. And it's like, I don't know any fan that hate, hates the thing or hated the thing. It was like huge to, in, in me and my circle when it came out. Yeah. You know? I, you know, it, it you, we, I was so single-minded as a 12-year-old kid, monster kid, mm -hmm. that it was so amazing because it was released in like uh, June 25th or something like that. 82, right? And in 82. And, and uh, at 
Well, I was on summer vacation and my, my cousin Nick was staying with me. He's my age and we we're just, you know, cousins hanging out. Uh, and uh, I knew the thing was coming out, but there were no publicity photos of the thing itself. Right. And so, boy, as a monster kid, didn't that just spark your imagination? Oh, yeah. And because we knew Rob Botine was going to do something and he just sensed something really cool. Well, he did for me, happen. for me, he did The Howling. And that was, that was one of my movies. Um, the Howling and Dawn of the Dead were the two movies where I thought, I have to learn how to, to do this stuff, this makeup effect stuff. Yeah. Those are the ones that, for whatever reason, I just thought his werewolf transformation was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so knowing that he was doing the thing was like, wow, you know, do you remember that Fangoria? Um, it was one of the issues of Fangoria where, uh, universal pictures had put out like a, an ad and it said coming soon from universal, uh, studios and it had video drum and and it directed by david cronenberg makeup effects by rick baker and then dark crystal jim henson and then it had what else it was uh a cat people mm -hmm. makeup effects by tom berman and then the thing special makeup effects rob botine and, and it was just like oh this is all coming out and i was so excited about all of them <laughs> yeah and, you know, being such a fan of Rick's, you know, I, I couldn't wait to see Videodrome. Oh, yeah. But there was something about the thing. <laughs> well, how was Rob going to follow up the howling? And it was, and, and the love of makeup effects was just starting to kind of solidify in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I was becoming obsessed. Yeah, And so uh, the only, no, no pictures of the thing, uh, publicity shots prior to the movie coming out. And I remember... Uh, we had a Time magazine, and I read the review of that, and and of course I think it was negative. Mm -hmm. And there was only one picture I think, and it was just of uh, Kurt Russell's McCready. Mm -hmm. It came came in from the the snow, the blizzard, and he's all frosty and everything. And I I just I wanted to see the thing, right? But, <laughs> and, and and so uh, my dad took my cousin Nick and I to a, a late show, and uh, <laughs> it's so weird. We go into the 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 auditorium and no one was there and the film was just ending so i was as what we were watching as we were getting ready we were watching the end credits oh no oh okay okay and so i could see you know it was just because it was just the dark screen and the right. credits and then all of a sudden uh rob botine special makeup effects crew and then it, it showed all the, right. the list of credits and i was just beside myself with anticipation <laughs> and there's and it was pretty much just my dad, my cousin Nick, and just one other guy sitting up close to the, the and that was it. Yeah, it's amazing. And it was like the second, um, it was like a Saturday, I think it was, and just the second day of being released. And it, it yeah, it was so, so bizarre that there wasn't more yeah, an anticipation. And, you know, up in Utah, I can kind of understand that, but when you saw it, where you're from in LA and San Pedro were, were tell me, describe the theater and how many people were there. And I, who did you go with? You know, I don't remember anything about it really. I mean, other than the movie was oh. amazing. Uh, yeah. I, and I, and I was just completely like just stunned and shocked at the effects and I loved it. I don't remember. I used to go with my stepdad. He used to take me to see like, we'd go to like a science fiction or a horror movie every Friday. Mm. That was like our thing. And so I'm yeah. sure he took me and cause he was like, he, he loved science fiction. Um, and, uh, uh, I remember, I mean, I remember the theater wasn't super crowded, you know, it was maybe average. Uh, but that's one of the things that, uh, John Carpenter was saying also in these interviews is, um, they didn't market it well. Universal didn't do good marketing or part of the reason that it didn't do well, they didn't market it well. And, uh, ET came, was came yeah. out and it was like the anti ET movie. It's like so grim, totally. so totally. dark, uh, what a, you know, a dark ending and so violent and, and gross and, and creepy. And ET was like very heartwarming, family friendly, <laughs> you know, so it has a little heart light, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> But you know, he benevolent. 
Yeah, yeah. He was just kind of ahead of ahead of the curve. You got you know time. You, that, what they say, timing is everything. You know, it's like you kind of got to be. Even like Videodrome is is that way too, in a way, because um, that one didn't do that great either, from what I remember. And that's an amazing. I mean, it's a freaky movie and oh, a lot yeah, less you know, mainstream, it, but yeah, it's prescient because yeah, uh, basically. Totally. Yeah, it's it's about a company being able to um, program a viewer of this particular underground channel to be able to change their their brain, brain chemistry yeah, and their thoughts yeah, yeah. and everything, like, and to be controllable. That's basically propaganda. Yeah, oh yeah, and, yeah. And that's going on kind of right now totally. without getting too much into it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it foreshadowed it. Yeah, it was, it's it, amazing. Also, uh, I know this is off topic of uh, the thing, but um, I just watch Existence the the. The yeah, Gunnerberg. I haven't seen it in a while. Has I just watched it recently, and and again, that's it's like stuff that's oh. happening now. It's all you know. It's like about VR games, basically, and you can't tell what's real and what's not. And yeah, you know, another Cronenberg predicting the future type thing. Yeah, but anyway, Cronenberg's great. We'll have to do. We should do a Cronenberg. <laughs> we, we should because I want to. I want to talk to you about Crimes of the Future too. Have you seen? That I haven't one? seen. I still haven't seen Crimes of the Future. Oh. Yeah, you can watch that, and then we can maybe yeah. have a Cronenberg yeah. night. <laughs> have you seen uh, History of Violence? It's old, but... Yes, yeah, I, I love it. I love that movie. That was so great. I love He's, it. Cronenberg is amazing. And the, the, and the, the Dead Zone is like the best the Stephen King adaption of any, I think. And it's I agree. Totally, totally solid, amazing movie on its own. Yeah, it's it's actually, I think, more satisfying than the book. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, think, I don't think I ever finished the book. But yeah, it, what, it, it's perfect that movie. Yeah, it is. It's perfect. Christopher Walken and and uh, what Brooke Blair? What's her name? The actress. Oh, she's so good. Yeah, yeah. Brooke. So, oh shoot! But I love her. She was in a Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That's right. At the time. Which is another one I watched recently. Another uh, with Donald Donald Sutherland, the the seventies, late seventies remake. Philip Kaufman, the director, I love him. It was a great. And I I thought it was a great, great movie. A great yeah. movie, really good. It's like there was so kind of similar to the thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, absolutely. Anyway, okay, back to the but, thing. But, but but real quick, you know, um, it's it's fascinating that the thing was received initially like it was. I know. So what's what's going on there? Was it just simply something that was so? just ahead of its time or the, or the zeitgeist just wasn't ready due to um, coming out of the seventies and Vietnam and just didn't want to see well, think, something so bleak or yeah, what do you think? Well, think about it. Think about it. It was, it was, when did Reagan get elected? It was like, 80. okay. So it was like so right after it was in the Reagan era where it was all like America's back. Uh, yeah. Everything was getting super materialistic and yeah, uh, kind of this toxic positivity and the ugliness of hyper capitalism was happening, and the religious right was was in, getting in with uh, 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 politics. And mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing is kind of like uh, it's again, it flies in the face of that. It, it's it's not optimistic, <laughs> you know. When Reagan came in, it was you know he came in with that. I forget what his saying was but it was like a morning in america yeah morning in america, morning in america. <laughs> well and you know carter uh he he made a mistake near the end of his uh term and that he wanted people to the the citizens of america to discipline themselves and 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 you know uh you know tighten their belts or whatever right. uh because of you know we we're just coming off of um you know the I guess the oil embargo mm -hmm. and the gas prices. And yeah, I remember sitting in line with my mother for an hour to get gas. Yeah, I do too. Oh my God. And Carter told us some, he was going to give us some tough love yeah. advice. Yeah, yeah. And no one wanted to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and so hence Reagan comes in and it's just a, like a denial of reality. Right. You know, and, and so the thing is kind of like if, uh, if something was going to, okay, just think of it as what if, another species visited this planet and they were equivalent to us and how right. we treat other species. Yep. We would, it would be as horrific as the thing. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. they'd be top of the food chain and we'd be harvested. And, and, uh, even, even the way the thing, I was thinking about this, even the way the thing, uh, absorbs its victims in a lot of ways is how, uh, a lot of life forms on this planet transfer their energy because you have to eat something and consume it and, and mm -hmm. the energy is transferred. That's pretty horrific. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if we were just one notch below the the food chain and we had to deal with the, that daily reality of not getting literally consumed and absorbed yeah. by something, um, that's a horror show. Oh, and yet yeah. that, in a way, is kind of the rules of our existence I know. on this planet. <laughs> That's why oh. that that's why horror movies are important is because it's like life is horror or, or there's an it element is. to life that is horror horrific and you cannot deny it you cannot deny it it's like even if you got rid of all the horrible things that we horrible stupid things we do like mass shootings wars people screwing each other like things that are not natural not within the natural order even the natural order is horrific, you know, because horrific. it's like, it's like brutal, brutal, violent, rape, murder, killing, eating. It's like, oh, it's a know, horror show. It's it a horror really show. Is. It really it's is. A horror so show. Like, you know, that's why there are horror movies. I imagine if, if there are a need for them, because it's, it's part of life, you know? Yeah. It's like the grim fairy tales. We need yep. something to kind of help process this reality. Yeah. The, the, this truism and you know that I, I maybe it has to have that horror that you know blood of tooth and claw reality to make sure that the dark side of the yin is as dark as it can be and that the yang is something else that maybe we can help achieve through mm -hmm. love and compassion and whatnot so yeah, yeah. it almost like it guarantees a kind of balance, but right now it almost feels like it's out of balance. Well, that's, you know? yeah, that's when the problems come is that it seems like nature's kind of got a natural equal equilibrium of birth and life and, and, uh, death mm -hmm. and destruction. And when things get really crazy, it gets way out of balance. Like one dominates the other, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's never, the light side dominating it's always the dark I side know. dominating and then it's like it seems it goes sometimes it might get close to equal and then it goes back that's the way it seems anyway from from the, the human perspective but well it was dominating in et yeah right <laughs> that's true that's true in and so yeah the thing man it is it's as bleak and that's what i that's what i love about it oh yeah it's so uncompromising so yeah absolutely you know? and you know one thing i do remember uh, about when the thing came out because i saw it i just was like this is amazing i couldn't believe it um and i was you know watching tv and i saw i think it was leonard malton give a review of the thing mm -hmm. and um and i was so i think it was him i was so pissed because he was like you know the acting is good and blah 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 but gore is just not my cup of tea and so he gave it a bad rating and he just kept saying, I know he said that, like he alluded to that. It's very gory and violent and that's just not his cup of tea. And it's like, okay, so you're going to, so the whole movie sucks because you can't handle the gory stuff, you know, instead of like trying to see it in the context of the film, yes. of a horror film, you know, come on. As, it just seems so As a professional critic, he yeah. could have um, at least... Yeah, celebrated how it, groundbreaking it was. Yeah, or yeah, right, right. Or said I, I, it was a great movie, but the gore made me sick or whatever. That's legitimate, you know. But anyway, I remember watching that as a kid. It's so funny. We were such nerds, the kind kind of kids we were, you know. Because I remember watching it and being all like pissed off. It's like, what? I don't know. How old are you? We're like around this. You're. I'm I'm 53, so we're two okay. years apart. Yeah, I just turned so I was 12. 56. I just okay. turned 56. Uh, so yeah, so it's like. 14 years old yeah imagine a 14 year old like getting mad at a movie critic yeah it's like that just doesn't happen anymore <laughs> i'm sorry but we were nerds but that's <laughs> that's 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 why we got into movies you know well and and i think there was something particularly special about little monster kids at that time i yeah. i know i know we so when i saw the movie i i was single-minded i wanted to see 
Rob Bottin special effects. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know what the thing looked like. So uh, the anticipation anticipation was killing me. I, I just I had to go see that. No internet. There's nothing back. Then. None. You'd have you, to go we, and buy we were, a, one of the few magazines that might have a picture or something in it. And they didn't have anything yeah, until right. the movie was released. Yeah. I think Fangoria came out and they had that great Norris head on the cover, mm -hmm. and then it started releasing stuff. But uh, nothing, nothing, and that it was so beautiful. Just to have that anticipate that exquisite anticipation oh, yeah. of, of something you sensed was special mm -hmm. was set up to be special, and and so I, I still I think I'm not completely objective about the movie because it's still that I'm still that monster that that monster kid that was so enamored yeah. with it is still in me and I'm kind of biased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I really don't. But, you know, even when I try to be objective, I can't find many reasons to really criticize it. Yeah. It's extremely well done. Oh, yeah. In every way. Yeah. The script, the Dean Cundy's lighting, mm -hmm. and so much credit goes to, and the acting across yeah. the board, Kurt yeah. Russell. I think it's Kurt Russell's best film. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and um, John Carpenter, you know, bless John Carpenter. He, he, I think it's his best movie as yeah, well. Yeah, I think so too. I, I watched it cause I watched it yesterday in preparation for this. Cause it's one of those movies I've seen so many times that I don't really watch it very often anymore because I've seen it so many times that it's just like, yeah. you know, same here. I know everything in it, but, um, it, it was just the right amount of time. Actually, it worked out perfectly because it had been long enough to where I hadn't watched it in this, in this same in the same way that I watched it, which is more like critically, you know, trying to be less biased and trying to see if there are problems with it. And and one thing I noticed was it, you know, if you think about the um the the you know when uh, uh Wilford Brimley, I forget his character's name, the Don Blair Blair, Blair uh he when he's describing like how how it works, how the thing works after the autopsy scene. Mm -hmm. And he's saying like, this isn't, that's not a dog. That's an imitation, you know, and he's doing that whole thing. And, <laughs> and I remember like, I never thought, oh, that's ridiculous. How would he know that? And and I didn't this time either. It's like the storytelling was so good. And it wasn't like they didn't go into like all these technical details about why this was the case. Because yeah. I'm, I'm trying to imagine them being in this situation and not knowing what these what's happening with this thing. And I just thought it was so well done and well acted that you just bought it. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't I didn't stop and go like, well, how could they be sure about that? You know, he's just it's just conjecture. It was like I think and I think a lot of that was was just in the in the the pacing, the movie, the script and the and the acting, especially his acting. It was like it just he he, he the way he he presented it when he was explaining it just seemed felt so real, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but but the other one of the other things I noticed about it is just like it's definitely his John Carpenter's most beautiful, visually beautiful films. Every scene. The oh, colors, even like them in the rec room playing mm -hmm. with the ping pong balls. It's like, there's this kind of army gray greens and the clothing colors are everything about it was like, and, and the blue lights. Yeah. And the Dean blue Cundy lights put a lot of blue lights in there and They're the beautiful. snow outside. Yeah. And so yeah. Like, it was just like, I, I, and when they went to go to the uh, Nor Norwegian camp and they go and it's all like destroyed and, and it's like they're in the shadows really dark and then behind them is that bright white snow. Yes, that's a set. That's a set. And it oh, looked really? totally Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. It was amazing. It was so yeah. good. So it's, it's, it definitely, I, I do think it's probably his, his best film, you know, and I love John Carpenter. I'm like a huge I do too. John Carpenter fan from Assault on Precinct 13. Oh, you totally. know, up to, I don't know, go to Mars. <laughs> About that area, area, I was like, I, I didn't think, or Escape from L.A. maybe. Oh, yeah. That that was a little disappointing. Yeah. But he was like, he's so great. Like, like It's like, you know, I don't even, it's like, as a fan, I don't care because he did all of these amazing movies, most of he them did. with no money. The dude's a genius, yeah. super talented. Maybe these other movies were like a paycheck to him, 
which is fine. He deserves a paycheck. He deserves many paychecks for all that stuff. He made Halloween for 300 grand and it's like a masterpiece also. Um, Assault on Precinct 13 also. I love that movie. That, that movie's so cool. It's so good. It's so, yeah. The original, not the remake. I haven't seen yeah, the, the remake, original. But I imagine mm -hmm. the remake is just as good as suck. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I love John Carpenter too. And, you know, just, just thinking of him, I could just say John Carpenter and his name acts as like an antidepressant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, he just makes me happy. Mm -hmm. He, he, he created movies when we were at a very impressionable age and they, he, they kind of run the gamut. There's mm -hmm. horror, there's fantasy. I mean, I love, uh, uh, big trouble in little China. Yeah. And Christine, I actually Christine's really great. love Christine. I, just, I, just I think it's one of one. the best adaptations too of Stan Yeah, King. yeah, yeah. Uh, the Fog, I love the Fog. The Fog, the fog and Escape from New York. Escape and, from New York, amazing. Yeah, Starman. Star I love Starman great. too. It's mm -hmm. it's like you know what what I appreciate about directors like him is like you could tell he cared about what he was doing because the thing is when you're a kid you're impressionable and you see movies and you like them a lot of times, even if they suck, like you see people that are like really into ghoulies and stuff like these really bad mm -hmm. full mm -hmm. moon or Charlie band movies or these low budget crappy movies and they love them. But the people who made those movies didn't give a shit. They were not people that care. These are B movies where they're just trying to make a quick buck or a lot of horror movies, even Friday the 13th. I know that's blasphemy, but I always view Friday the 13th to me as just like a total rip off of Halloween without any atmosphere. It's jump scares and gore. So I'm sure I'll get crucified for this in the comments, but <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll, you know, I, I, there's a nostalgia factor for sure. Yes. yes. But, uh, and the effects, there were some cool effects in it, but, um, I was like more, I was, I was that nerdy purist kid. I was like, Halloween, come on. <laughs> I knew at that young age that the way that Michael Myers, and now it's a cliche and everything, but back then when he, you know, the way he sat up in the back of the, you know, that one scene or the way he just, mm -hmm. they, the way he shot it was so atmospheric and creepy that mm -hmm. that's what was great about that movie. Um, and not, and it did have a lot of jump scares, but not like nowadays. Nowadays, it's like jump scares only, no creepiness, no atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so the thing I appreciate is like I, a lot of people like they'll like they grew up like with or Chucky or something. And it's like, yeah. those aren't really great movies. They're not great movies. But if you look at John Carpenter movies, they are great movies. Assault from Precinct 13, it's like critics... People realize, even though it's low budget, it's a great film. It's well made. Mm -hmm. You could tell the people cared. They didn't have any money, but they cared about what they were doing. And so mm -hmm. I appreciate that it helped to form uh, my taste as a kid. So, because it's like he could have just made these crappy movies and not given a shit and made a paycheck, but you could tell he cared. And because he cared and made great movies, I grew up on movies that were great movies. And so I feel like, uh, it helped develop my my good taste in horror movies. You know what I mean? Yes. Because it's like you're we, kind of the victim of whatever era you're growing up in as far as what movies you see. And, and they might not true. all be great and you like them anyway. And that kind of affects yeah. what you like. You know what I'm saying? I do, totally. Um, and we grew up in that era of like the best, Exorcist, yeah. The Thing, The Omen, oh, the, the, all the, the Carpenter Omen. movies. The, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, think, think from the seventies and eighties nightmare on Elm street. It's like, we grew up with all the class, all like the best stuff, I think. Year after year, something, yeah. multiple movie classics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but what's, what's kind of interesting for me is I caught, a assault on precinct 13 just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I had never seen it. Oh, really? And, yeah. Uh, so I would say I saw it for uh, seven years ago for oh, okay. the first time. And, um, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. It, 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 it didn't, it, you know, yeah, it, it felt low budget. Yeah. It was a low budget, but film. I, but it, that didn't restrict it at all. It was a quality film and I love the music you uh, yeah. for that. Yeah. I, I love seeing that part of LA. Um, uh, me too. Where it's like all, and it's all, it's so creepy and atmospheric. Yeah. It's all desolate. 
Yeah. But it's like, oh man, it's like old, poor LA, you know, yeah. super creepy. And and the way that they didn't show the, the gang members attacking, you never see their faces. I thought that was yeah. so creepy. It made it kind of more like a horror movie. They're always in <laughs> shadow and you just see them for a second. And well, and even that, that one member, the gang member that, that, um, gets killed and is kind of the catalyst for them yeah, to attack yeah. you the only police see, station. You only see those three really. He's kind of, he's kind of, he, he, uh, Carpenter directs some kind of weird, almost like the shape. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's kind of like this weird non-talking, just uh, appearing out of nowhere. That's the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he shoots the little girl with the ice cream. And that's went, that's, oh, that's amazing. That whole scene that's amazing. is like, so, <laughs> it's so <laughs> like brutal. And so brutal. it's just perfect. But, and that girl was really good in it. Oh too. yeah, yeah. I, I was, she was she, perfect, her acting, like, overly sweet. You know, <laughs> she was in a lot of Disney twist. films. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but that, I, she that, was great. That dude, uh, that's the guy in um, Escape, Escape from, from New York, York with or, with the sharp teeth. I forget his name. Yeah, yeah, it, it's great. <laughs> I and I saw. I was lucky. I I saw that movie when I was fifteen. This is back when I was like a kid fan mm. at fourteen. 13, I don't know. It was when I was into Carpenters, probably after the the, the, uh, the Howling. Because I remember I, I got it where, back in the days when you rented a video recorder and then you rented a movie when it was yeah. just coming out video. And so I, I saw it like when I was really young and I was just like, oh man, I just loved it. <laughs> it just further made me a, a John Carpenter fan. Yep. Oh, totally, totally. But anyway, back to the thing. <laughs> I like how you're, you're kind of like dressed like you're, you're, um, at the outpost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I even have a little blue light. I was trying to find a blue light <laughs> and it does, it's, it doesn't quite work, but I have a, a friend of mine gave me this thing. Um, what is it? It's a little uh, toy thing. Oh, cool. uh, it has the kennel dog and, uh, sequence and it, a, a little, uh, yeah, I forget the, the manufacturer, but a uh, really well done. That's so cool. Cool. Yeah. But, I, um, I, it's I, snowing outside. So I felt, well, let's bundle up and perfect. <laughs> pretend we're <laughs> in an outpost. I watched, uh, before I, I watched it yesterday, before I watched Howard Hawks, Hawks's version of the thing, which I had never watched as an adult like i watched it when i was a kid and i was like this is dumb you know it's not scary my dad it was f for my dad it was the scariest movie you ever saw he Same said here. he I, said my dad saw it. yeah yeah he said he saw it in the theater and they had a big block of ice in the in the in the lobby of the theater with, oh, with cool. the with the thing you know with it all melted out and, and he just said, and he had to walk home by himself at night and he was like nine years old or something. He said he was so yeah. scared. And anyway, so, so, but, but, you know, as a kid, you're not like, you know, you're not mature enough to appreciate even black and white movies. I was like, always, I didn't like black and white movies. Just like a typical kid would be, you, you didn't like it as much as a color movie. But so now it's like, I love, I love all those old horror movies. I love all those black and white films. I love film noir, all the stuff I wasn't really into when I was a kid. Um, but uh, so I watched that first just because, and it's a great movie. It's really great. It's not, it is. it's, it's not scary to me. It wasn't scary, but it was like uh, just great. It was uh, really the way that they taught, stepped over each other's lines was really interesting. It's like, you hardly ever see that in movies. I don't know if you remember that, but like they would talk over each other all the time, which is really unusual, especially for a, a movie in the fifties, you know, okay. like trying to get this natural dialogue. It, it, I, I could tell that's sort of seemed like that's what they were going for, but um, it was cool. It's almost mm -hmm. like it's its own cool, good movie. Howard Hawks is a, you know, famous classic director, done all kinds of great films. Uh, but going to that, to, from that to the thing, it was like, I'm the thing is so much better than that movie. Even though that's a great film, the thing was just like, man, it was so much more realistic in every way. And not just in the effects, just in the whole approach of the thing. Um, and it, you know, it, I'm sure it has something to do with our age and, and how, how we grew up and stuff. But the, you know, the original thing, it was like, 
you know, they just, it was just the typical, like the men are the bosses. There's one mm-hmm. woman in it. They all take charge and they just want to kill the thing. And it's like the bad guy is the doctor who wants to kind of like, doesn't want to kill it. And it's just very super macho, uh, go kill, kill, you know, <laughs> just like typical 50 stuff. Um, and even though, uh, you know, the, the, the carpenters thing was, was that same kind of thing where they're just like, Oh, we got to kill this thing. There's so much more motivation for killing it. Cause it's like, you know, was, this creature is so brutally, you know, that first scene with the dogs is like, Oh my God, that's so horrific. It's like, what a way to, to, to come out of the, the, the gate showing how brutal this thing is by kill, you know, just going transforming from that dog and into all those, killing those dogs and squirting it with that that one shot with the dogs trying to escape uh chewing the the wire out how did they get that dog to do I that know. i was wondering that myself too yeah. it's like i was thinking that must not have been i'm sure that couldn't have been metal it must have been something easier yeah. easier to chew through but <laughs> that, that made thing. out of beef jerky or something <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, that squirting, it squirted that stuff. It was so yeah. freaky. Oh my God. Really great. Okay. Really great. Okay. So I'm glad you're you're talking about that scene because I, I had my nephew Bryce watch it and he, you know, it's kind of like this rite of passage. I always like to introduce my nieces and nephews to <laughs> movies I love. Uh-huh. And I, so I had him watch it with me and he was like, uh, I think he was around 13 or 12 mm-hmm. around the time. And when that scene happened, it really upset him. Oh, he yeah. almost, he almost like, uh, he, I think he's, he was just very concerned about the dog. I was going to make my granddaughters watch it with me last night. Cause they're staying with us for the weekend. And uh-huh. that's the reason I didn't, didn't like force them to watch it. Cause I know that scene would have upset them. Yes. Cause it's so realistic. And you and I are animal lovers. Yeah. I love animals. And yet that is not, that didn't bother me as same, a 12 year old. Same here. Or, that is or as an adult. I thought that, exact same thing when i was watching it i was like i don't know why because anytime a dog gets killed in a movie or an animal it's horrible i hate it, it yes i hate here. it it bothers me and it's like it's isn't that strange i wonder why that is it's because we're monster kids and and we the whole thing was it's it's in the realm of imagination yeah so it's detached from what was um i guess so my, maybe. My, my nephew bryce and we were coming from a totally different perspective as young monster kids yeah so it was all in the in that realm of imagination and and it i yeah we were kind of a unique audience we we i don't think we saw it or processed it like everyone else yeah. did yeah and and so i still don't and so that's what i mean I was, when i say i it's hard for me to be objective because i was really, really kind of surprised when my my nephew said that he was almost crying and i was like huh no, you're right. You know, yeah. and then I start feeling a little bit guilty. <laughs> Shame and, on you. <laughs> yeah. you. Terrible uncle. And and here's another thing. Um, I remember watching it and my sister was, they it was on TV and my sister was behind me watch playing cards. And, and she commented that the effects were almost like comical. Mm. She said, these scenes are almost laughable. And I was like, what? And, and I totally disagreed, but, but again, she was coming from a different How old is she? perspective. She's about nine years older than me. Oh, interesting. And, and so yeah. she's, she saw it as being just absurdly over the top kind of thing. And, uh, wow. whereas I was like, it, you know, I was kind of mildly irritated when she said that. <laughs> Insulted. <laughs> but, but again, she and my nephew, they just had a totally different angle on it. Right. Uh, you know, I'd never thought of them as comical except yeah. I, I will say the 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 spider head that whole scene was sort of comical in a dark yeah way. it had the one really good laugh line and yeah 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 yeah, it's, yeah yeah so there she may have a point but um but they took okay, me so this, back to the, the, the extremeness though was terrifying like the oh. norris thing that floated up with the his eyes like were bulging out and stuff. And he was just like, oh. ah, those big teeth. It was like, it was anyway, go ahead, go on. Yeah. I, I, um, I want to talk about that one too. Yeah. I want to talk about how wonderfully well done that is, but really quick back to the kennel scene, you know? So, okay. You and I are watching the movies. We're in antici- as a boy, we're anticipating seeing 
the monster, and the kennel scene is that introduction. Mm -hmm. When that, when the dog turns towards the camera and its face splits open, yeah, it was like my brain did the same thing. Yeah. It, it is like okay, this I was in, you know, entranced. Yep, it, it was, and and it's like it started to get. I was experiencing reactions and emotions I'd never experienced before because it was so surreal and imaginative. Totally. Yeah. And, and I remember feeling that way as good. This is, this is kind of amazing. This is amazing already. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so it's like this, yeah, I could appreciate it as a little boy that this was, we we're in uncharted territory. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And it, it's funny too. If you, if you think about it, it's hard, it's hard to, talk about all this because it's like there's so much cool stuff we're just gonna be bouncing around we're not hey we're, we're unformatted yeah. here but a lot of it was it was so you know for an effects person to have such a, a signature is really incredible i can't think of any other effects artist that has such a such a um uh indelible fingerprint on their work as Rob Bottin. It's like, you can always tell Rob's work, at least for the monster stuff specifically, like mm -hmm. the, 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 all the, uh, the, 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 all the tentacles coming out of the dog, you know, and it's like that crazy kinetic, yeah. you, could, yeah. you know, it's like in the, you know, the paint shaker that he's <laughs> Rob yeah. uses the paint shaker for everything. It's like a Rob <laughs> thing. And it's amazing. Yeah. You know, anytime you see something shaking, it's like a paint shaker, I believe. Right. Like the, yeah. the yeah. to mix uh -huh. paint and it's, and he's the only one I know that did that, but it's like in the, uh, um, uh, the twilight zone, the movie, all those, those crazy monsters he made for that, that one, uh, sequence, they're all shaking, you know, wow. and it's like, oh, it's Rob's paint shaker thing again. <laughs> it's so cool. Well, and, and, you know, my favorite part of the, uh, Eddie Quist transformation in the Howling yeah. was when, when, uh, Robert Picardo's, you know, stretching his, ch well, his chest out yeah, and yeah, then he starts yeah. shaking and vibrating and yep. they, they played with the, um, the frame rate. Oh, okay. I didn't know and, that. And, and, but he was also shaking and it was just, that's, that's, yeah, Amazing. the dog smile, you know, it's like, it was so, that dude was, I wish that he would come out of, I wish he would come out and do interviews or something. Cause that dude is like, it's serious genius. Like seriously, he, he did much. the howling at 20, 20 or 21, 20, 20 yeah, and years thing, old. And the thing, the was, thing at 22, how yeah. can you do the thing at 22? You yeah. know, it's incredible. It just seems impossible. It's, he was already fully formed. It's crazy. He was already fully formed it's crazy. in his twenties, and you know, when I, sometimes when I think about the thing, I get exhausted because I know, having worked for him, how much time he spends on the sculpting, yeah, and the design. I mean, even things you wouldn't think he will. He's got a process that he has to go through, of of. Kind of like Rick in a way, in the per perfection, but it has yeah. to has to hit all of the 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 parts of uh, quality that he's striving for, and and he he needs the time to do it. So like, if you think about all the sculptures in that movie, like just in the kennel I scene know. alone, and and of course, I Stan think those Winston, are yeah, Stan Winston did the, the did that one, the arm puppet one, which is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, um, but you know, there's even one shot of the, a dog that's it's it's kind of just sitting there pan, you know just kind of trying to breathe and the tentacles they filmed it in reverse yep. just kind of go and swarm it but even that dog i know i know he's that was spent sculpting and getting it just right mm -hmm. and and it it's even perfect. It's all, it looked perfect it was only on screen for just a second yep but it was totally believable. All the dogs looked absolutely real. There's not one shot of any of the dogs that looked fake. Any of the, like the dog that gets shot, you know, the dog that, the one that you're talking about, it's covered with slime and gets covered with the tentacles. It's like all of yeah. them look totally, because, because a lot of times there's great, there's great movies and there'll be like a, a dead animal and you could tell it's kind of fake. You know, it's like even, even that's the thing about speaking of Rob's uh, expertise. It's like even the bullet, hit in the eye of the Norwegian guy was like, that's a really great prosthetic. It looks so real. 
and uh, the other dude that got shot in the head, um, laying mm-hmm. there on the table. The guy Clark. getting the stitches in his yeah. leg. It's like these things looked. They all everything looked perfect. Mm-hmm. It was kind of amazing. Well, and even even I noticed this watching RoboCop recently that you know when Murphy gets killed with the bullet uh, to the head, even that little appliance. Mm-hmm of that had style about it. That bullet hit had style. Yeah, yeah. It had it had a proper balance of shape relationships, you know. Mm-hmm. One big one big uh, uh bulge ne- and a couple of wrinkles the smaller next to it. I mean, it was thought out. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, that's I know that's what he applies to everything he does. So when you do something like the thing, no wonder he was so exhausted. Mm-hmm. And and even though he he only sculpted I think that um uh, beautiful norwegian bifurcated head yeah that was actually the first time you see it right yeah it's, uh it's one of the, yeah it's, you're right yeah you're so right that's like kind yes. of the first yes yeah. yeah inanimate but that's that is the first time you're right and that's incredible yeah and that's like stood the test of time that it, that face is just like it's it's a classic it's, i also want to say it's like a classic piece of artwork at least for fans it's like of, of horror and stuff that head it's just iconic, you know, it, it it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, I've seen a lot of talented artists try to replicate it. Oh yeah. I've totally, I haven't seen anyone that's nailed it yet. I've tried to, I've tried to, I, I know when I was younger, I tried to do, <laughs> rip it off, you know, or at least do sculptures like that. You know, it's, yeah, it's like the, same uh, here. it's like the, the, the high watermark of coolness. And it, it, it did kind of, and it was, you know, Okay, let me ask you this: Is that one head or two fused head? I know what I th- I know what I think it is. But the 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 prequel that came out in two thousand eleven, they made it they kind of uh, con- conceptualized it as two people merging. Oh, really? Because I thought yeah. it was one head stretched. I always imagined yes. it as like one or one head kind of being formed or something. Yeah. That's what I thought too. I it looked like something was splitting. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's in one half is just literally just kind of it split and then is just sliding off. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it. So, so cool. when the prequel came out, which I, we shouldn't even probably even talk about the prequel. Fuck that the prequel. Gave mig- yes, <laughs> gave me a migraine. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> I hated that. Movie. How could they? How could they miscalculate that? And and sit and so. Poorly, you know. I'll, was... t- I'll tell you. I'll tell you, man. I because I the shop we I was working at the shop I was working at was bidding on that, and we we did designs for it to try and get the oh, top. spectral. Yeah, was spectral. it spectral? Mm-hmm. And w- when I met with, I think it was the director and a producer, and I could just tell they were not the right people for the job. They were like, you could tell they were not hardcore fans of John Carpenter's The Thing, and it's like, oh wow. I could just, I was like, this is not going to be good. I knew it was going to be bad. I knew it was going to be bad (laughs) because it was like, I mean, they were nice enough and everything, but, but there was no reverence for that, for the, for the source material, you know? You know, exactly. You're act, you know, it should have never been made. I know. I I don't want that wonderful kind of, um, Norwegian, um, incident to be defined any further i want to leave it in the, to my imagination yeah, yeah it's kind of like um prometheus i when ridley scott made prometheus it's like i don't want to know the history of the space jockey or what it yeah, is yeah it, the it, beauty it, of that was like what the hell is it and just letting your imagination and so <laughs> it's so lazy for these studios to sit and say well we can capitalize it's on a, this. yeah it's a it's a cash grab I, it I, is I, i'll say you know i've i struggle with this myself with the dystopia book because I, you know, the dystopia book is like, it explains the characters. Oh, and yeah. I was like, man, I, I really struggled with it because it's like, on one hand, it's such a cool idea and such a cool project and a way to kind of develop a story and have, and I don't know, I just thought it was so cool. It was such a cool idea to do. And, but then I was like, okay, but I'm, but I'm like giving, uh, you're going to, I'm going to lose something to get this thing. I'm going to lose the mystery yeah. in a lot of yeah. them. And so ultimately I was like, I, I felt like it was worth the trade off. And if, you know, you really were, say you, someone was really into my artwork, you could always not really pay attention to the dystopia book and just enjoy the artwork on its own. But there's definitely a trade off there when, when you tell, when you tell too much, but, but the, exactly, you know, so 
and, and if you're going to do it, even if you're going to do a cash grab as a director, you, you better make it. I could, it could have been good. It could have been at least good. I didn't think it was even good. It just was I, I honestly, I haven't watched it without being pissed off. Like I, I don't even think I watched the whole thing. Cause I was so kind of upset mm. when I saw it. Cause it was like, this is not right. This is not capturing the spirit. This is not honoring that movie. It, and, and it just pissed me off. Cause it just seemed like, Oh, these people don't really care about what they're doing. That their heart's not in the right place. I felt anyway, but well, um, Chet, here's the question. Maybe, yeah, it, it just simply should not have been made. And, yeah. and movies that pay homage to it should simply not be made. And and I, I was even thinking about this. What if Rob Bottin came out with a making of the thing oh, man. In, in exhaustive detail and, and showed all of the thinking and everything and all the stuff? That would be incredible. It would be incredible, but, you know, we might lose a little bit of that mystery. Yeah. Too. That's true. That's true. But I, man, I, as a, as a, I love process stuff and behind the scenes. I would just, I would, I would, I would be willing to. <laughs> It'd be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> right. I'd make the trade off for that because, because it would be enough time has passed and I've got to enjoy it at like this for so many years, 30 years or whatever. I would too. And yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I wish I, I couldn't, would... I couldn't help myself. I, yeah, I have. <laughs> And, but, you know, if he's, if he ever did that, I'd want him to just go all in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like an encyclopedia size. He should do a book like Rick did. He should. You yeah. know, he really should. I, Rick's book's amazing. It's amazing. And it's so, it, what a, what a, what a gift. Yeah. You so, know, to all of us and to his crews and yeah. everything worked for him. And, and that's kind of where I think, you know, I hope maybe Rob reconsiders because, he did have a lot of really talented people working for him. Yeah, that's that's one thing I wanted to mention too. Is one thing about that, um, and you probably know more of them because you worked there. But most of the names on the crew list, I didn't know, and I was expecting to know more of them. Like I knew mm-hmm. Brian Wade, I knew Jim Cagle, mm-hmm. and maybe one or two others. And the rest of them are all. I didn't even. I don't know any of these people, and so I wonder if you know. He, I'm sure he had. Uh, uh, what uh, he had his staple of people that he just kept. I imagine. Yeah, like I, I wrote down some of the crew, but okay, now's a good time just to give a shout out to one person in particular. Okay, who who I think is maybe Margaret Bracera. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> she is not given the um, Margaret Prentice now, right? Yeah, I I think she may be one of the more overlooked talents in our industry. I mean, oh, yeah. if you think if you think about it, every Rob Bottin movie, she was pretty much the painter. Yep, and and I think she may might be one of the most talented effects people, you know, this industry's produced. Yeah, yeah, really. she she is underrated in that way. She's respected in the industry, but I don't think she gets the. She's very acknowledgement she, that yeah, she deserves. Yeah, but she's super. Uh, it's funny. It's like I've been wanting to ask her to come on the podcast for a long time. And, um, I don't know if she'd be into it or not, but, uh, you should try. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should. Cause I've worked with her. She's super cool. She's super, super talented. And, and like, like you're saying, very underrated, uh, as far as, but she does, she's not, she doesn't seem like that kind of person. Like she's, she's not into it for that. From my, from what I, it seems like she doesn't like go for the glory. She's not like she always wants to talk about that stuff. Yeah, you know, like you're right. all the great stuff she did. She just is like, you know, she, just she's humble, you know. She, I remember, you know, because I, I didn't work with her uh, at Spectral at all, mm. um, but I, you know, I, I did work with her. Very, I mean, it's funny because on Seven, she she wasn't a constant presence in the shop, but she would just come in when it was time to do something, mm-hmm. and and I just remember her coming in and painting the the gluttony victim her and uh, tom flouts and it's like oh my god that's beautiful yeah and then she just leaves she just comes <laughs> in and, and performs her brilliance and then just leaves and comes back and so understated but but really really gifted yeah and 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 uh you know and then there's henry alvarez and that's right and, and, and then 
Art Pimentel, his regulars, great mold maker. I mean, he, Rob had a hell of a talented crew. And uh, yeah, I I think for no other reason, you know, Miles Tevis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with a lot of the designs. And I think for no other reason, I think maybe, and it wouldn't take away from Rob's brilliance for him to put out a book and maybe acknowledge some of these people because it it was it was synergy you know he he needed he was the orchestra director and he needed the he needed that symphony to right. be able to create what was in his head but but the thing but the thing is you know you know a lot of you know this as well as i do a lot of shops the guy at the top is not the best artist mm -hmm. you know but he knows to hire the best artists and then he can get great work out of him rob was like Mm -hmm. the best artist, you know what I mean? As far as if, if for that, uh, the creative genius, I, I don't think, you know, anyone in his crew could maybe, I don't, I doubt anyone in his crew could have done, had those created those effects with their own crew. It's like, I think, cause Rob, you know, to do that, that sort of thing at 20 years old or 21 or whatever, it's like, that's not normal. No, it's, it's not genius. normal. That's like, you know, it is. He's a 40 a, he, or 50 year old man being in charge of that crew is, would be. Bro, yeah. But that's insane. He, it's crazy. It is. He's like this weird anomaly. This is almost freak. Yeah. <laughs> freak of brilliance. Seriously. Because he, and you know, you're right. It, when you work with them, you know, as, as, as artists, you want to kind of see, okay, gauge what your employer's abilities are yeah and, uh you can't help it you know you want to know where you stand you want to know how much to push back if you disagree with something right. or trust or how much trust mm -hmm. and uh one thing about rob and I've, I've told people this before and i may have even told you whenever i felt pretty confident and say came up with a good idea rob was the kind of guy that would come back with three wow so it's like Oh, he's yeah. kind of on another level. Yeah. This guy's imagination is is kind of special. Yeah, you know, he, he sensed it. Yeah, he yeah, sensed it. yeah. Because you know the, the the you know with people like especially in the tech industry now, people like Elon Musk, they're like considered these visionary geniuses. But you know, the more you look into them, you realize they're Probably they're not really, they're not They're It's a PR thing. Yeah. And they got all the money in the world so they can hire all the best people. But someone like Rob, it's like that. He is that real genius. He uh -huh. is the real thing. Cause there's no way, there's no way you could have done. There's no way you could do the howling at 20 and not be a genius. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. You know, or the thing at 20, 21 or I don't know. I forget what. I, yeah, I, I remember um, when I was working on Mission Impossible, I was about, you know, I, was, I told you this before, and, and uh, I was working the night shift, and he would come in in the morning and talk to you, and then, then I would, uh, oh, wait, this was not uh, Mission Impossible. This was his directorial debut. And he just kind of riffed one morning, this almost like a, a, a scenario with one of the sculptures I did, and I, I can't go into detail because I don't want to reveal exactly what it, what the movie was. But I remember driving home and going, my God, that was so clever. And, and just realizing he has just, he's just like this percolating, this kind of brilliant ideas constantly. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, if I, if there ever, there was a doubt, you know, that was definitely assuaged right <laughs> i was going this guy is pretty amazing well was, uh, he it, really really is he the other thing about him is that he had the the, the amazing ideas and he could sculpt the thing if he uh -huh. had to yeah you know as good as anybody if not better you know that 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 norwegian head proves it yeah and, yeah and yeah yeah it is it it's beautiful it's yep. a beautiful i did see the sculpture and and it's just beautiful I uh, man, yeah. I, I am uh I tell you, that's one of my few regrets in effects is I never got to work for him. And I know he was a tough boss. I've, I've heard he was very demanding as far as, uh, wanting perfection and, and, 
you know, have having things go the way he wanted it to go, the way he thought it should look. You had to do it exactly from from what I've heard from other people. And uh, but I don't even care. I still wish wished I would have gotten to work with him. He was my favorite effects guy. He was the, he was the the north star for me when I was a kid. It's like I you know of course Rick Baker everybody Rick Baker's amazing also. Um, all these you know all the top effects guys were great, uh, but f- it was like that extra weird. He had mm-hmm. that extra surrealist weirdness that I really liked. You know, whereas yeah. like Rick's work to seemed like. He, and and it's like it's another aspect. It's not be- one is not better or worse. It's but they're both uh, like Rick stuff seemed to more suit the film. The style of what he was doing suited the film. Like that's how, that was my impression. Like he would make work that that f- was suited the film. That was for mm-hmm. the film. The style, the feel of the film. Whether it's you know going to be a little more cartoony for Harry and the Hendersons. It's going to be super realistic for Greystoke or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rob stuff, it's like <laughs> Rob, Rob stuff is Rob stuff in these movies. You know what I mean? Or, and maybe he got, although, although that's, you know, I guess I, I just associate the, the more weird work with him, but he did do stuff that was not over the top, like seven, like the stuff you were, you worked on. Um, well, that was kind of over the top. The sloth victim was a bit extreme. Yeah, you know? but but I'm ta- I'm. Th- but I loved it. it yeah, worked. yeah, yeah. Oh, it was amazing. But I, I'm I'm thinking like the Twilight Zone stuff he did with those Big Daddy Roth characters. It's like yeah. I he probably got chosen for even RoboCop with the melting guy and you know yeah. the oh, very so cool. these are very Rob like effects. They are you know so but so whereas I totally get the idea of you know Rick, you know Rick. Baker serving the film, which is really kind of what you should do. I think as an effects person, you should, you should be a team player and you should make the film. It should fit in the film the way it should stylistically. Whereas Mm -hmm. I think Rob is, his thinking seems so like over the top Mm -hmm. with crazy ideas. He's more, Rob, I guess is more of a surrealist. And so that that's, I just, Almost That's changes a, the movie a little yes. bit by including his work in it. You know, I was saying? just going to say that, yeah, because Rick and Rob are kind of like two different sides of the same coin. Yeah, Rick is like a naturalist, mm-hmm. and and Rob's like a surrealist, right? And right. and Rob, Rob told me. Uh, and one is that, not better than the other. They're just no, no. I and that's just it. Artists, you know. And he told me he was uh, bidding on um, uh, Greystoke, hmm. and I remember seeing. That would have been the, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I saw one of the Greystoke sculptures of, of just a head sculpture in, in, in a shop. And he, I don't know the story behind that sculpture, but it, when I saw it, I went, hmm, I think maybe... Rick was the better choice. Rick was the better choice. <laughs> but, but Rob told me that when he had... He interviewed with, uh, when he talked to Hugh Hudson, the director, he said, can I just stylize these apes just a little bit? Just, can I just go outside of the parameters of naturalism and realism? And, and I think that what's, what's kind of ironic is I, I think Hugh Hudson, Hudson kind of, uh, was hesitant, but what Rick did, he kind of stylized those apes. Mm-hmm. He and, gave them character so for sure. He gave but they looked him realistic character. still. And and the the head that I saw at Rob's was not as I don't know. I wasn't. I I know I was. I wasn't blown away by it. Mm. But then I don't know the story of it yeah. exactly. But whereas Rick stuff, Rick was the perfect person right. for Grace. Yeah, Stone. yeah, absolutely. Rick, and and Rick Rob owns... was the. Yeah, Rob Apes. is the person, perfect person for the thing. Right. You no. Know? Right. But then again, look what Rick did on Videodrome. That was, you know, but that was, that's the thing. It's like that suited the film. It did. It was yeah. perfect tonally for that film and, and uh-huh. he nailed it. So I, I see Rick as more like, more like the team player that will make 
you know, he's yeah, he's got yeah. an amazing eye. He's w- one of the greats. You know, uh, he's he's a, an amazing painter. He's, he's a amazing, genius too. He's a genius. Yeah, he's a, he he's is a genius. A genius. You see it, you yeah. feel it. And he's one of those it, guys, yeah. when you work for them, you know, it's like, you know, okay, this guy is like someone I feel good working for. Cause yeah, I, he knows he trusts. Yeah, I, yeah. He knows what looks good and what doesn't look good. Um, but, uh, but, but I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's to the point is that uh, it makes sense. Like Rick, cause think of all the movies Rick's done. It's like everything he's done has been totally appropriate for the film. And, uh, Whereas RoboCop, uh, it was amazing, excellent. I don't, but it's like, it's got more, it's kind of got Rob's Mm -hmm. fingerprint a little bit. And I think it changes Mm -hmm. the movie and makes it a little crazier, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, I could see it changing it. Like, okay, a movie's got a certain style. Uh, There's like super realistic. And then there's like totally cartoony and crazy and blah, blah. The, a film's got a certain style. I could see Rob doing effects for a film, slightly putting it in the crazier side, just by mm-hmm. just by the way he approaches effects. Like Total Recall, that's a perfect example with the, yes. the lady and the 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 head. That's insane. <laughs> that's crazy, and it's like it's one of those things where she, you know, the everybody knows what I'm talking about. The lady whose head splits apart and Arnold's underneath. That's like, <laughs> that's crazy, that's mm-hmm. crazy, and that's so Rob. <laughs> it's 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 like, you know, it's one of those things. So so well, and and even the heads that that um are exposed to the atmosphere of Mars and they start ballooning. Yeah, yeah, and the eyes I mean, bulging out. That it's fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah, it's Rob. a it's amazing, but it's like Rick <laughs> Baker would not have done that. It would have been it wouldn't have been that crazy. Yeah. It wouldn't have been that like I don't want to say cartoony, but you know what I'm saying? It's like uh-huh. dark stream. Yeah. It's so yeah. it's so it's interesting. It's just interesting and and it's it makes me wonder like you know, why Rob never pursued a fine art career because it seems like Rob is I don't want to say that though, because Rick's an amazing oil painter. You know, mm-hmm. he, Rick could have painted. Rick could have been a gallery artist. He could be. He could mm-hmm. be a gallery artist. He just doesn't want to. He doesn't. Yeah. He can do whatever he wants now. But, um, but like you said, he's more of a naturalist. Like the, his paintings are more like really great portraits of horror film characters and stuff like that. But Rob seems like he would have been an amazing kind of surrealist artist. And what a shame to not know, see Rob in a fine art setting. Although maybe he was made for film. Maybe he's, he was made, he was perfect at effects. So maybe, maybe that's a really, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. I imagine his sculptures, like his sculptures in a fine art context. Okay. I'm going to tell you something that really sparked my imagination when I was working with Jim Cagle. Um, cause you know, Jim Cagle, wonderful sculptor who worked on the thing. Yeah. He said, okay, so Jim Cagle first was working for Stan. Mm-hmm. And so he, <clears throat> he worked on the kennel thing along with, uh, Lance Anderson and, and, and oh, yeah, that was another thing. thing. I didn't know Lance, An- I didn't realize Lance Anderson worked on the thing. Yeah. Michigo Togawa is her name. So mm-hmm. those two you see pictures of, and then I think Jim Cagle worked on it cause Jim said, Rob wanted the kennel dog to kind of look like the prophecy bear. Hmm. Oh, and so wow. kind of use that as your guide and you can kind of see it in yeah, there. Yeah. And, and so, but after, so Jim was, and Stan did that sequence and then Rob hired Jim to come and join his crew. Mm-hmm. And so Jim, and this is so cool. He said, he told me about when he first went to, to meet with Rob. And Rob took him in this room to show him all of his maquettes for the thing. Mm-hmm. And and this is so interesting. Jim Cagle said he described them as like these weird, twisted Alice in Wonderland heads. Weird. And it's like Alice in Wonderland. And, and I was like, yeah, he just these weird. I don't even know how to describe it or how it would have looked. <laughs> what that but, means. <laughs> but isn't that cool, though? Mm-hmm. It, it Somehow, Alice in the Wonder. Alice in Wonderland informed some of the thing. Right. And, and so, yeah, I, and I, 
I want so much to see those maquettes. Oh yeah. And they were maquettes that Rob did because he would sculpt these maquettes while Mike Plug, who also deserves a lot of credit, right. Mike Plug, would would do the 2D stuff. Yeah. So yeah. um oh, but, but but uh uh also Rob is did you see that drawing he did when he was like 14 or 12 or something? Mm -hmm. That Lon Chaney or something? Yeah, he gave to Rick. Yeah, yeah. that thing's amazing. It is. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so, aside, aside. Well, but it, but it is fine, fine art. Yeah, I think maybe it was not his calling. I just, movies. He yeah, was such a good fit for movies. Yeah, right. I just, I'm like, it's maybe my own... Uh, prejudice because to me it's like with fine art you can do anything that's to me fine art is the it's the open open-ended you could do anything within fine art you could make a movie with a bunch of crazy effects in it mm -hmm. and have that be exist in the fine art realm whereas film is very specific as you know what i'm saying oh yeah so totally. so to me it's like but that's just me, I guess. Cause, cause it's like some people, some people are perfectly suited to do effects in films and they're geniuses like Rob. Matt Rose was someone like that. He was an amazing artist, amazing sculptor. He could have been a fine art sculptor. Um, I've seen, I just, some of his stuff, he would mess around sculpting. Mm -hmm. you, you remember those balancing acrobat things he sculpted just like, they were on his desk. It was just these like blocky, loose, like acrobats, kind of like balancing on a ball or something. And it was just like amazing. Yeah. But Matt was like, I remember, I remember talking to him at the at the at the time when Rick's was closing down because because he was like a lifer, right? Yeah. And and I and, and me, I was like, I, I, I always thought that way. As soon as I got bitten by the fine art bug, I was like, everybody needs to do this. These all, everyone always talks about wanting to do fine art in effects and nobody does it. And, um, and I was thinking like, we all want to do it. This is our thing. Fine art ultimately is the end game for all of us. And I was kind of like, he was really bummed when Rick's closed down, you know, he was like, he didn't know what he was going to do. He was thought he'd have a job there his whole life. And I was like, you know, and I was establishing my fine art career at that time while working at Rick's. And I was like, yeah, you just got to kind of find your thing. And he's like, this was my thing. And, it, and it like kind of hit me like, yeah, he's, he was made for effects. That was yeah. his thing. And, and it's not like there isn't a higher thing. There is your thing. It doesn't, there is no level when it comes to your thing. There is your thing. Your thing could be a fucking plumber or an electrician. Mm -hmm. If you're totally into that, it's mm -hmm. not about like climbing these steps. And once you get to fine art, you're the greatest. It's, it's, that's my thing. <laughs> that's, that's my view. That's personally what I want. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember when he told me that I was like, oh, that, that was like, you know, my consciousness shifted a little bit like i never really thought about that it's like some people really are better suited better suited to that than to a fine art career because it's like i i feel like i wasn't i'm better suited to fine art than effects for for, for like there are certain things in effects that didn't click with me like putting makeup on actors and you know, yeah. the social aspect of things and even project management. I was not good at it. I yeah. didn't, I didn't have it in me to make sure the snaps were all in the perfect place on the suit. Yeah. I just didn't like, I couldn't, it's like, I just didn't have that level of interest. It was, you know, it was like, I think as a sculptor, I was good, you know, and a painter in, in effects, but not, there are certain aspects of it to where it's like, I just, <laughs> well, Chad, when did you, so tell me how, how did the, the, the Chet, the fine artist come about? Was it a gradual thing? Did you all of a sudden, did it hit you? I mean, your, your stepfather was, James was, well, you're already always around that. Yeah. But, but when did it hit you that, okay, this is what I want to do? Well, I'll tell you, it was, um, uh, I think it was slow, a slow, gradual thing. 
um, Jurassic Park came out. Uh huh. And then everyone was going like, oh, makeup effects is going to die. And I started thinking, oh, maybe I should start looking to do digital stuff. And I started learning digital and I got really into that too. I know. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it was, uh, 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 and then I started working at Rick's. And aside from being inspired by all, like I was working with the best artists in the business at Rick's. It was amazing. And I was like, oh man, I thought I was so great. And then I go and work there and I'm like, oh, these guys are all way better than me. And I just was like, I took it in, man. I had Mitch teach me his detailing techniques and I just took it in like a sponge until I feel like I kind of got up to that level with all you, you did. guys, you know, like you did, but it was humbling when I got mm. there, you know, um, so, but, but <clears throat> part of what got me into that, I, I had also been seeing Mark Ryden uh, mm. was getting big around then. I had this Mark Ryden book and I was just starting to get really interested in painting. And mm -hmm. I discovered Bekshinsky on a tool video. Adam Jones introduced me to Bekshinsky and I was like, this stuff's amazing. I was always a Frazetta fan. And so slowly I was getting more interested in painting and then I started working at Rick's and then Mitch, I was Mitch. We, we sat next to each other because for some reason, Mitch liked me and we barely knew each other. It was weird. Like we'd met on, uh, the, on the blob because he did some stuff at home and he brought it in like the, that, the little, uh, the miniature stuff he sculpted for the blob. Uh -huh. And it was like, I don't know. Mitch is just nice, kind of nice to everybody. So, so maybe I'm just like, you know feeling special when he just treated everybody like that. But I remember when I got there, he's like, Oh, you could sit next to me. And, uh, it was so cool. But anyway, he was so bitter <laughs> about the effects and he was constantly complaining about like not getting the respect, not getting the time. You know how Mitch was always complaining about yeah. how, how we weren't respected as artists and uh, just not in those words, but like, that was a general feeling like this is a joke. These movies suck blah, 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 you know? And it was like, it totally started infecting me. And I started getting mm -hmm. really like looking at every time I was screwed over, getting listed mm -hmm. after the craft services on the credits, which on the thing I noticed, even on the thing, Rob's cruise credit is, he got a title credit, but the crew got way below the gaffers, mm -hmm. and, you know? And it's like, come on. It should be at least a little higher. Anyway, so beside the point. So it was like, I started kind of thinking like him in that way. Like, you're right. We aren't, we aren't being respected and even too, too far. I started going too far and I started getting kind of bitter, really bitter about it where I had this love before of it, like a yeah. really passionate. And, you know, it was just around that time that I was trying other things. I was trying digital. And then I sent that a video of Clive Barker a to Clive Barker of my digital stuff to try and get work as a digital artist, maybe because I was thinking effects is dying, uh, practical effects. And he said he didn't have any work for me, but he's have, I, did I, did I ever think of fine art? Because he said I had a vision with my digital stuff. And I was like, wow, I never really thought of it because the, the thing is my, I did grow up around a fine artist and I saw how, hard it was to make a living. So that's, that's yeah. part of the reason I got into effects. I was super passionate, but I was also like, this is a better way to make money. You know, no one's buying monster art in 1985 or whatever that I you know there's no galleries or anything. So it all kind of came together. Uh, and then Adam Jones, I remember at one point saying that he really liked my, my paint work on, 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 you know, more than my sculpture. He liked my painting, my airbrushing and stuff that I did on, on, yeah movie. So it was like all that stuff kind of swimming around my head and thinking that effects was going to die and thinking I had to maybe try and, and getting inspired by people like Mark Ryden and the pop lowbrow yeah. people and stuff. And, and I just yeah. finally was like, I had it in my mind, like fine art is if I can make it in fine art, I can kind of do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And that as a creative person, you know, it's the, the, the dream. You know, it's, it is. And, uh, I, it's, it's what you're meant to do. And it, and it's so interesting that, you know, when you mentioned Matt and even Rob, Matt, and I can kind of understand this because it's like in the effects industry, I like those parameters. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're an envelope pusher, you need to know what the parameters are so you can push beyond them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's someone like Rob, he, right. he, 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 he could, that's kind of what he specialized in. Let me, let me take this as far as it can go. Let me, let me push it. Uh, the thing is a great example. And mm. Matt pushed quality. Right. Matt pushed his quality. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like, you know, Matt, Matt needed those parameters and people like Matt needed those parameters. It is a different hat. Yeah. And uh, I know we've discussed it before, but when you, jump into fine art where there are no parameters of yeah. it, just your imagination. It's overwhelming. Yeah. 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 It, it, when I first started, I really, I drew a blank when I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Cause I did that one little painting. I, I told the story where I was like, I was thinking about doing it, trying for it to do it. And then the cannibal flower group shows I heard about those started, those were happening, getting popular and kind of anybody could show at a cannibal flower show. If your work was halfway decent. So while I was on set with planet of the apes, I painted this little five by seven painting on a piece of paper and acrylic paint. I remember. Yeah. From, uh, from ape acrylic paints. I had for the ape to yeah. touch up ape pants. <laughs> it was ape kind dust. of this weird, uh, like almost like a hollow head. Yeah. Wasn't it? With thing? Yeah. yeah with like kind of horns going through it. It was just like some weird thing. I sold it to Hiroshi for a hundred bucks. <laughs> 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 My first painting. This thing I could probably sell this dude, this dude, uh, 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 a collector of mine has a, ta his whole back is tattooed of that. Really? Yeah. That oh little five by seven painting. He got a whole back tattoo. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's flattering. <laughs> yeah. Uh, his name's Dylan. Oh, so cool. Uh, he, he's, yeah, he's super, super cool guy. Um, uh, but yeah, so I painted that painting and I was like, okay, I can do this. Mm. I, I proved, I, I was like, his name's Dylan McClary, by the way, the, the guy with the back tattoo. Oh, really, okay. really cool dude. Um, uh, uh, so once I, I said that to myself, if I can do this, if I can paint this little painting, then I'm going to give it a shot. And I, and I painted it. I was like, this is pretty good for my a painting. I've never really seriously tried to paint before. I just dabbled here and there, a fine art painting. And so that was it. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to try and do this. And I just kind of went for it from there. But it was, but the thing is like, I did, I needed that push from Mitch aside from Mitch being bitter and infecting me with his bitterness <laughs> I needed that. I needed that um, as a way yeah. to like, cause once I got out, I was like a year or so passed by and I was like, you know what? That was a great job. That was, we had so much fun. We had so much fun sculpting monsters all day with cool people that are your friends. It was great. It was yeah. so fun. But, um, but I needed, I needed, so I, I needed to folk. I kind of need, I feel like I needed to focus on all that negativity to help me let go of that. You know what I mean? And once I got I, out, I, you know, it must have. It was, it was, uh, it was a, yeah, it was a combination of things that you needed. Uh, uh Clyde Barker, yeah, yeah, uh, and and Mitch, and all these the confluence of uh, of events that kind of uh, helped you to detach. And the, and, yeah, and the other thing, Mitch, whereas he was like so negative on on st all of that stuff, he was really like, yeah, you should do it. He was so supportive. He was like the most supportive person I think out of anybody I knew. Like he would always just always, every, every time I did it, I had a new piece. He was like, yeah, you got to do it. He keep, he keep, he'd always say like, yeah, you got to keep doing the fine art, man. You got to get out. You got to get out. And it, that's cool. It, it was yeah. so cool. Yeah. So Mitch is like this mystical uh, <laughs> uh, figure in my life. He's like the wizard that comes in and it's like, he'll, <laughs> he'll probably listen to this. Cause he, he really likes, likes you. He said he listened to our other podcast. I send him links. Okay, every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and so he would he'll laugh and think it's bullshit. But it's but for me it wasn't. He was like this a pivotal figure in my life where it was like mm. he can It was like he was the guy. He was like this guy that guided me out of effects. It was it was kind of amazing. So I'll always be that is that in, is indebted, well, and, indebted to him for that. And and he you know Mitch is so talented that whatever he has influence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's the best so, sculptor in the business. I mean, he was just yeah, amazing. Yeah, so it's like if he says that then it then it it has impact. Yeah. So, yeah. He called, he called me Sp spaghetti man. 
Chetty Spaghetti. He was like, you got to do it, Spaghetti Man. You got to keep doing it. You got to get out. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's great. Yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, man, we're so we're so far off of the thing. Well, I, uh, but you, it's all related, it, I guess. It is, because you, know, you know, I, 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 it wasn't meant to be for Rob to uh, get into fine art. Yeah, I, but I, but yeah, I, I just he's such an enigma, and he's so secretive. Nobody knows anything about him now, or what really what he's doing. And it's like, I, I can't imagine having that kind of imagination and talent and not doing anything with it. I know and that's what trips me out. Well, yeah, and you know the industry's changed, so he's he's that he can't he's not quite compatible with that. And, I and know, it is. It's, how could, do you how do you get into fine art or these other? You know what I can see him doing totally, is writing. Oh yeah, yeah, true. You know, he, he might he might be one of those guys too that's so such a genius that it's like he can, like you said, he could do he could be a writer and be totally amazing at that too. Yeah, you know. I don't know. I wish I wish I knew because he was such an inspiration to me for, and a lot of people that I know. Um, totally. I wish he'd come out of hiding. But, well, I you know I, I told you I I have frequent Rob Botine dreams just because of um, my how I left his shop. And, oh uh, yeah. I would really really like to disconnect with them at some point and just make amends. But uh, I but it, you know what? It doesn't matter. I think. I just hope he's happy. I yeah, hope he's yeah. living a good life, you know. Definitely. And um yeah. I, I yeah, that's that's really all you can wish cuz I sure do respect him. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I hope he's I hope he's doing well. But Me I too. think you know the but I almost think uh doing behind the scenes stuff and making of would be something that would give him a lot to chew on. Yeah. That could be, you know, he could, he could almost like tap back into the industry and movies, but yet not get into it. Right. Right. And, and he, I don't know. Cause How? he, he did, he did an interview for Rue Morgue, uh, uh, on the thing and. Oh, fair. Recently, recently, it, no, about 10 years, 12 years ago. Oh, okay. And it was so delicious because he, he talked about his thinking behind, uh, uh the kennel scene. And stuff, and and it was so rich and smart and imaginative that the you thing, know he that, could. That's the thing, artists, great artists like that. The world needs them, especially now. That's so another much. reason I wish you would come out. It's like the world needs you, Rob. <laughs> it's like we need people who think like you. That everything's fucked up and going to hell. It's like we need more people yeah. like you that have these amazing visions. You know, this is. I really believe that. I do too. I, the world does need them. They need to see a singular vision, a conceptualist, a, a talent, an articulate talent, and and someone that, despite <laughs> whatever uh, uh, quirks he had, he delivered quality. Right. It was it was in his DNA, and uh, that's what he aspired to. Yeah. And, it, it changed. People like us, it changed our lives, really. I it know it's, it sounds extreme but and nerdy, but it's true. It's really true. It was like a huge source of inspiration for me as a kid. Oh, so much. And people need to know that there are these singular individuals out there who can, that have that much power within their talent. Yeah. To just, just to kind of influence genres, to, yep. do, to do that kind of thing. And, and I think it'd be very inspiring because, you know, now – film industry uh, effects are so crew oriented, you know, uh, so such large visual effects crew. There isn't like this, these like um, singular iconic artists that you go to see movies for. Right. When we went and saw the thing because it was Rob Botin going to be Rob Botin's yeah. next movie. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm going to go Rob see Botin's Grace and Stoke. John Carpenter's and John Carpenter. It was like yes. those both yes. those together was like, and you know, John Carpenter deserves so much credit. Oh for yeah. Just yeah. Trusting this young. Tw- yeah. Imagine that trusting. A I young know. 20, 22 year old kid to, to <laughs> be in charge. Crazy. Of it. That's, that's what it, <laughs> thank you, John Carpenter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it's all him. Cause how, how do you sell that to a studio? How do you, how do you get them to what he's 22? How do you get a studio to do that? Right. And, you, and, you, can you imagine that he made that film and then after that it bombed so bad that he couldn't get hired. 
And that's why he took Christine. That's I'm glad he, he did. Yeah, you know, and Christine's because great. Christine's great. Firestarter was just kind of I, I Christine suited him very well, but you're right. He it 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 was there a did it benefit in any way John Carpenter having it bomb like that did? And I, that's he, Rob told me he went in the like right a week after the thing opened. Rob said he went into John Carpenter's office, and John Carpenter was devastated. Yeah, so he, imagine he had a he had a variety and says, "Our movie's bomb. My movie's bombing. I, I can't believe this. People hate it." And Rob, being the optimist, says, "Oh, we'll just." We'll just do it better next time, you know. And but unfortunately, they never had it happen. Again, yeah, so. but but imagine making a masterpiece like that and knowing no one knowing that it's great because yeah. he because he must he, he said it's his favorite movie from from yeah. an in, I saw in an interview he said it's, he thinks it's his favorite movie. Imagine making a piece of work like that and then having everybody hate it. <laughs> it's like it's got to be totally That's, devastating uh, as an artist totally. to to. to 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 experience that it's it's and especially it's so undeserved you know it's like he should have been he, they should have been raising should have been paraded around the the city for making such a great movie hey get over here i got the dog hold on the garbage trucks out there i got i got her it's okay hold on i'm almost there sorry shut up you little rascal Hold on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, you gotta stay in my lap. Sorry. Yeah, it's just it's it's so wrong. It's it's like a, a an injustice that that movie it, bombed for it, him. It, okay, so something happened. This is actually kind of fascinating that it could actually be made. And it, it could actually be done when so many when when it was so incompatible with the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. It's like so. So who was channeling what? And we had a discussion about the muse last time. So, and the art gods, and and so. I suspect Rob's influence on that movie was profound. I think yeah yeah because you know. He he even said that uh, John Carpenter was saying that the idea that it wouldn't have a look is a, is a Rob idea. He said that was Rob's yeah. idea, and that's like huge. <laughs> that's a huge part of the the movie. Rob may have introduced something to this 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 project that was way ahead of its time. Yeah, and and it and it, and it and it pulled everything else towards its. It's, you know, magnetism. Yeah. And, and, and it, even, even though I know John Carpenter, it, it would be devastating. Maybe that, maybe it's, maybe that's, maybe that's, maybe that's the price of making a masterpiece. I mean, okay. Imagine you were John Carpenter and God came down and said to you, okay, you can make a masterpiece but no one's going to appreciate it for another 20 years and it's going to bomb and you're going to have a hard time getting work or you could make a really popular movie that's not going to be that great that people yeah. won't really care about. What would you choose? I mean, it's hard. It's a hard choice, but I think I think an artist that really cared would probably... I, I bet if you asked John Carpenter, he'd say, oh, I'd take the, the one that people would like, but, but, <laughs> but, but as a... You know, he's made, you know, uh, I forget, I think it was Quentin Tarantino was saying, I saw an interview with him because I did a little bit of research for this episode. And he was saying that he thinks it's one of the great, you know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest horror movie ever made, if not the greatest, one of the greatest movies ever made. Yeah. It's like that good. He was on Stephen Colbert. Yeah. Uh, and, and Stephen and Colbert they were just it. praising yeah. it. And, and I, I would say. It was. It was. A, it, he he blessed us with an incredible movie. Thank God he's he's remained alive to be able to see yeah, now. Yeah. What he he's able. Well, everybody's able to get perspective now and yeah. see what an extraordinary accomplishment that movie was. Yeah. Because people, it is. It, it's holding up. It's aged. It, it's hardly aged. It's yeah. better than most. 
everything about it, the editing, the performances, his direction, the screenplay, the, the yeah, lighting. It's 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 it one of those movies you could tell came together. Yeah, where yeah. you know the great great films and, and great art in general only happens when you have that extra thing come in, that whatever mm-hmm. that thing and make you know you can have everything lined up. You could have a great script, a great director, but if you if everything's not clicking and working together, it's mm-hmm. not going to be a great film. And yeah. it's like the great ones. There's like a, that magic there. Yeah, and that's with any piece of art. Would you stop it? Hey, come here, come here. Um, sorry. Uh, but I, I did. I wanted. There was a couple other things I did want to mention too about that. I that I noticed, and I wonder if you ever noticed this. Wasn't it a weird choice to have uh, Copper have a nose ring? I thought that, that was... Have, I know. It that was must cool, have been just though. Richard Dysart. Yeah, that but must it, have been just him. But it's it so eat. interesting that back then yeah. people didn't have nose rings like today. <laughs> and to have yeah. like this older white guy doctor... He was a doctor, right? Co- or no, he, Copper was... Was he? Copper was a doctor. Okay. Mm-hmm. Have a nose ring. It was strange. It it was and yeah. cool and cool and it was like this little bit of character is like oh this guy's a little freaky kind of <laughs> you know he's got a little <laughs> edge to him, um, I just I always thought that was a trip, I always thought that was unusual and kind of cool and, and you know it's those kind of details that that really make a character seem real. Well, and I'm wondering if that was Richard Dysart mm-hmm. just bringing an element of himself into the character or if he actually got his nose pierced. Yeah. <laughs> but I, think, I think it was probably him bringing that part I, of himself. I bet you they, 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 you know, the stuff, all the stuff that I read in the little mini, that old documentary, they made, stop. Hey, uh, the, 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 the actors were, everyone was like into it and like mm-hmm. talking about their characters and like mm-hmm. talking about, if you are the thing, do you know you're the thing? And like, they're super into it. Everyone was re- from, from what they were all saying. And it shows, you know, that because every, everyone cared. Um, but the other thing I wanted to bring up, and we have to talk about this scene, of course, is the, speaking of copper, is the, you know, the chest, mm-hmm. which is maybe my, I don't know. There's so many great, effects it's hard i was gonna say it was maybe my favorite effect but you know then there's the head that comes off after which is crazy but that where you, okay let's let's get into this yeah, scene because yeah uh, it's it's so fantastic yeah, and, but but oh, before yeah. we start i want to tell you there is a and i want to know if you notice this this is just a nerd out effects nerd thing <laughs> there is yeah. a flaw do you know the flaw do you know of that the, sequence? Of that scene, of the, where the hands go in? Okay. Uh-huh. I'll, I'll tell you what I think the flaw I, is. I know, I know there's a flaw. Oh, you do know there's a flaw? Yeah. What's the flaw? What do you, the flaw is that when the hands pull out, they don't rip right. according to where the jaw closes together. Thank you. Is that what you're saying? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it how nerdy so we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like... Oh. Let's let's get into the squid weeds on this because we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the uh, uh, the 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 jaws clamp on his wrists, and he pulls up, and <laughs> on one of the arms, it doesn't rip where the where it should. It rips yep. slightly above, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would notice that except people like me and you. And you know that that uh, what's so cool is that that. There's a second shot of the the chest chomping on the yeah on the arms and, and it kind of looks like a great white shark mouth yeah it, it, the, 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 the 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 like the torn part of the skin tucks under and and it looked and the and the teeth were these weird kind of like crystal gray almost and like weird yeah totally I mean they didn't look looking. like teeth at all it yeah. was just fantastic yeah but you know I think my favorite sculpture or my favorite creature of that is yeah the duct norris monster the when he when he attaches itself to yeah. the duct and he yeah. you know um i think so disturbing it it wasn't it there's a close up of it and it, it was lit kind of dis- poorly and it and it, was, it surprised me because it's almost like it got away from Rob or something because it didn't have any shadows or yeah, anything. Yeah, because Rob Rob is notorious for liking to light his work. 
yeah. and shadows and stuff to make it play super realistic. And when you first see it, it's kind of a middle shot. The character, a character moves out of the way and you see this thing and then it cuts closer and then cuts to that. But when you first see it, it's lit beautifully. Some nice yeah, shadows yeah. and stuff. And then that is a really beautiful sculpture. Yeah. It's really, so, really cool. It's really cool. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I would love, oh man, I, I fantasize about going to the Heartland um, warehouse when they were making it and just seeing all these sculptures. Oh, I, know. I, I can't imagine how amazing they were. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that sequence. Um, oh, by the way, I, when I was working on Benjamin Button, I asked Art Pimentel, because he was the mold maker there, head of the molds. I said, where's the Heartland, Universal Heartland warehouse? And, and he told me it was somewhere, I think, on Lank, off of Lancashire. And I, I, I had him draw a diagram <laughs> of, of <laughs> where, the warehouse. And I said, I want to know exactly what part of that building was the shop. And he, he drew, he said, this is where we entered. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and so I, one day after Benjamin Buttons, I, I made a point to go drive at this empty, war, this warehouse and the gate was open and I drove all the way in and I, I, I looked at where they went every day to create the thing. Wow. It was, it was kind of, it, it was so, it, yeah, it was, it, it was so exciting. It was thrilling. And it's like, <laughs> who, that's so weird that we we'd be uh, thrilled over something like that. A grown man. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you one more story before I forget. Okay. That, that kind of illustrates how unique our frame of minds were as monster kids. Um, when I was in junior high, uh, I had just seen the thing because it came out during the summer. And so it was autumn and I was in junior high. I was in seventh grade. And I was in an English class, and every every day in English, uh, they would we'd have a break and we get to read whatever we wanted. And there was a selection of like books and magazines. And I don't know if you remember Ranger Rick. Mm -hmm. It was just a small little pamphlet like book. Yeah, and, I remember. Well, I discovered in one of those Ranger Ricks at this class was an article on the thing. Oh and wow! It a, and it had a picture, and I know you've seen this picture. It's the picture of Rob. And John Carpenter looking at the the Palmer animatronic mm -hmm. before it had the skins, you know. Yeah. And that was so cool. And so I every day I just kind of like go grab that magazine, look at it, <laughs> and just stare at it. And one day, <laughs> I heard this voice behind me, the girl behind me. She goes, "You must really like that magazine." And then I and then a guy to the left of me and just one seat back says, "Yeah, he looks at it every day." <laughs> That popped my little monster kid bubble and I became self-conscious. I bet you were so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. And before then, I was just in my own little zone. And I bet you were happy. I was happy and I just stared at this and just stared at it. I probably looked at it for two weeks every day. And then finally, I guess these kids just couldn't take it anymore. These assholes like, oh, who don't man. understand. And so I couldn't look at it anymore. Oh, sad. But that kind of illustrates my whole mentality. I was, just, and and yours too. We were just in our own little, oh yeah, wonderful little bubble, imaginative bubble, and and yeah, I I didn't have any other friends really, at, at least that I went to school with that were like that. And yeah, so, same. Yeah, yeah. No one was into effects really. Um, yeah, I I mean I I remember that. Look, at, you you get the magazines, certain magazines that you just look at. Over and over and over and over, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, it's just not like that now, you and know, it would, I would, I would bring Fangoria's to camping trips, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so I would just go inside the, the cabin or whatever. And I'd look at Fangoria's and, and just think, and I guess fantasize, you know, fantasize yeah. about working in the industry yep. and making yep. pictures. Yep. Wondering so, how they did it and looking for was, flaws and looking yeah. for seams and or looking at there, there wasn't any seams. Like where did the where does the blend line go? I wonder. You know, just all yeah. These... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Nerd> oh, alert. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, let's yeah. Let's let's embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Nerd, uh, before we finish with the 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 Blair. No, excuse me. The Norris sequence. I do want to say. You know what my favorite sequence in the movie is? Mm. The Palmer sequence. Yeah, I was going to say that too. Okay, okay. Maybe we should 
finish up the 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 Blair scene and then go on okay. to the Palmers because because okay, yeah. So the Nora scene, yeah. wonderful defibrillation scene. The thing pops up, attaches itself to the ducks, and then the head starts. To yeah, start. and the head is the head is so cool, uh, just the way it stretches, and then it's green yes. inside. And then when the skin rips on the neck and the tongue's going all crazy, another very Rob thing. It's a very simple mechanism, yeah. but it works. Yeah, it's yeah. the tongue. Yeah, yeah. But, but when the head, when you got that other shot from behind at the edge of the table and it starts sliding down, it looks yeah. so real. It's like, and it's great because the eyes are closed and uh -huh. it doesn't, you know, because eyes, eye mechanisms are notoriously difficult to make look really real. And so it's like, you know, if you want to make a realistic looking head, it's easier with the eyes closed and it's got that mm -hmm. expression and the eyes are closed and it's sliding down the, 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 the wow. edge of the table. It looks so Beautiful. good and it's lit it's in shadows. There's a lot of shadows. Yeah, there, yeah, so yeah. You can see some of the, and you know, Rob was lucky just like he was with Robert Picardo with that, with Eddie Quist that he had this actor that had such a unique oh, face because yeah, yeah, Charles yeah. Hallahan had a really unique face, yeah, the great, distinctive, great face. And, great and so, yeah, I love the way that looked. And when it first separates and it's just kind of open its mouth, yeah. the tongue comes out, that head moves so well. Oh yeah. And that, and that had open eyes. And eyes the eyes open. were amazing. They, they yeah. were great because, you know, I've seen so many eye mechanisms on projects that are like, you could, it's just not quite right. It's so hard oh. to do. And, and I remember one of the things I remember reading, uh, in Rob Bottini interviews was how much money they spent on the, on the, mm. on those heads. And like people would, he, I think he said people would shit if they knew <laughs> how much money they spent. And it's like, yeah. I, I can see that cause they are really pretty perfect. Thank God he did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it is, it's, it's so memorable. It's a classic scene and it elicits a kind of response that I think is totally unique to cinema, to yeah, art, to yeah. anything. And I think that's why someone like Quentin Tarantino and stuff, they recognize something really uh, special was occurring in that sequence particularly, mm -hmm. because you could not telegraph that chest opening up. And then once it does, again, it's like that dog, the kennel scene where the head splits it shocks you and then it takes you on this really wicked little roller coaster ride that's, of, of stuff that's unprecedented. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like he he puts his hand, you know, does a defibr defibrillator, cuts his hands off, which is crazy. And he's like, ah, with no hands. Yeah. Then that thing shoots up. And and you see that one side view on the table, and it's just like the shaking paint shaker and, yeah. the, and the little tentacles and all the yeah. stuff. And then it shoots up. It's got that totally disturbing caricature of of that actor with all the just misshapen body and the spider legs. Then you're like, that's insane. Then the head starts coming off, mm -hmm. and crawl, and and then it falls on the ground. And it's and it's so disturbing the way it's all like ah, it's just creepy the way it's moving and the mouth is open and it and it's just and the eyes are kind of looking it's just so perfect and then the the tongue whips out that thing or that tentacle whips out and wraps around the chair and it's dragging itself towards under the desk <laughs> it's great yeah right and then the spider legs come out and the stalks and that's like. It's like you think you've you've seen the most the craziest thing in the beginning, and it and keeps it, getting crazier. Yeah, and, 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 and so then what, beautiful. Yeah, and then and that sculpture is amazing too. I'm curious who did that sculpture of of that that spider. It's got those crab legs, and mm -hmm. it's got the head the Norris head upside down. Another brilliant design characteristic. Well, it's all twisted, and the stock is coming out of one of the eyes. It's just like. It could have been Willie Witten, but because I, I, I I know um, Jeff Kenimore did the um, the sculpting much of the thing that attached itself to the duct, mm. the Norris, that cool. I, I know Jeff Kenimore had a lot to do with that, mm. and um, so it and Willie Witten was a a big at some point. I think he was, yeah, he was just a major com, uh, contributor I to. I that. don't. I never met him. I never really heard I, his. Nor have I, and I haven't. His, and I've tried looking online to see some of his work, and I, I can't really see it. I never that, heard of him in the in the in the industry, really. Yeah, you know, you know. 
and we know Jim Cagle and and of course Henry Alvarez. Um, they, uh, I mean, yeah, but uh, but then there was James Cummings. I know uh, worked right. on it briefly, yeah. and I'd like to talk to Brian Wade and see what he did. Yeah, because those were the main sculptors, you know, those guys. Mm. And I worked um, with Brian on the Blob. I should yeah. have Brian on. I should have Brian on the show too. Uh, I've I, worked with Brian too, and I really enjoyed working with them. And he's really and a very fun, talented guy. Yeah, that yeah, would yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah. To talk to him about that. Yeah. But that sequence is just simply amazing. Yeah, those spider legs. You know, I, I had um, growing up in San Pedro. There was the Cabrillo. Cab, Cab, you know, if you're from San Pedro, you pronounce San Pedro wrong, and you pronounce Cabrillo wrong. <laughs> Cabrillo wrong. Cabrillo. We call it Cabrillo <laughs> Museum, and it was like <laughs> it was on. Cabrillo Beach, Cabrillo <laughs> Beach. And um, <laughs> there was, it was like a marine museum. And one of the things I remember from- my, I've been there. Oh, really? I've been there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one, I don't know. When I was a kid, there was a diorama with these big sea spiders, these big yeah. crabs with these big ass crab legs. And it was all lit weird. Like it was super creepy. And that used to freak me out. Like I was fascinated with it. And that's one of the things I love about those, that head effect was those legs that come out that are kind of like spider crabs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then that's the other thing. And then, you know, you've got the head peeking around the corner, like all that, and it's kind of upside down. <laughs> And then it runs out, which, and then it has that amazing, you got to be fucking kidding line, which is hilarious and horrific. And then it runs out of the room and it's kind of funny, uh -huh, but it's uh -huh. like, it's, it's also horrific and funny. Yeah. It's weird. And then they torch it and then it spins around in a circle, <laughs> which is also very disturbing to me. The way, and then the great sound that? effects the, too. Yeah, yeah. And that weird like high pitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The sound Speaking effects are great. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, uh, it's an amazing sequence. Yeah. And I think it's incredible. It's, it's kind of like he, Rob and everyone involved, John, um, they, but particularly Rob, they created, he almost created a new kind of a, emotion. It was like an aesthetic kind of reaction that was very, very unique. And it gets back to what my sister's saying. Oh, this is comical. Well, yeah, maybe it was. But it was also, it's also surreal. It's also gross. And it's horrific. imaginative. It's, it's scary. Creepy. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's such a combination of these different elements that it, it it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. It's one of the great sequences of movie cinema. making, I think. Cinema, yeah. yeah. It's like just amazing. It's a perfectly paced and directed mm -hmm. and the, the, it's just amazing. Editing. Everything. Every, yeah. Everything. It's, it's so perfect. Everything matched. I mean, because those were all filmed at the Heartland. You know, all the effects were filmed in the Heartland uh, warehouse. And um, so those sets had to be duplicated there. And and it, and it and even in some scenes, you can see that they're not the actors, but they're stand-ins. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it, and it, but it was seamless. Yeah. Yeah. Seamless. It's perfect. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the Palmer okay. sequence, because that uh, that's one of my favorite sculptures and most disturbing sculptures in the whole movie is when he first starts to transform and it's like his eyes are all bulging and it's his face mm -hmm. and he's got those creases in mm -hmm. the brows and it's kind of like really sorrow you know like it doesn't have like the ah, angry brow like the norris it's kind of got like the sad almost like ultra sad furrows yeah yeah it, it's like these arc kind of yeah. um rainbow folds it's and creases so and, and that's creepy. that's and dave clennon yeah that's it, dave clennon the actor's um forehead because i've noticed and that that's what his forehead does oh wow and so so rob cast him i guess you know him trying to hold that expression okay but it was it was it was cool looking yeah and, and, it looks it looks like exaggerated version mm, of that i probably I, uh, you know because yeah. it looks like it's a because this head is pretty distorted and the eyes are bulging and the blood is like pouring out of his eyes it's so amazing okay so here's the question chat <laughs> the editing is a little bit wonky in that sequence but there's it it, it ends with the, the 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 head ballooning and all this blood coming out mm -hmm. what's that try what's that uh, um um that uh, chemical that expands foam latex again that was so uh, toxic. Tri tri trichloro, trifluoroethane. Yeah. I think. I think 
don't you think that's part of what that effect was doing? That's because you could question. see some of the foam latex kind of ballooning like the spasms had. Yeah, I that wonder. Dick Smith did. And I think he, I think they pumped that and they pumped um, blood and, and it just started going ballooning crazy. And that's, and then that's what you, the final shot was, was just that ballooning because in some areas you can still see what looks like that original Palmer head. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think they cut to a different one. I think it was the same one. And, and unfortunately the, the <laughs> editing didn't kind of convey it quite. It needed one more insert of, yeah, of yeah. Head between, you know, uh, just before the ballooning. Right. Head. Right. Yeah. I, that's one, one, one. Is that the, that's the same stuff, right? One, one, one. Try so. For people who don't know, I'm sure most people, well, a lot of people that listen, if you're an effects nerd, you know that one one one, I think, is a chemical. It's banned now, I think. Trichloro, trifluoroethane, I believe, is uh if you pour it on foam latex, it makes the foam latex swell. And it was what Dick Smith used for the help me uh welts on Reagan for the Exorcist and uh painted help me with trichloro trifluoroethane, if I'm saying it right. He painted help me and then evaporated it out so that and then shot it in reverse so that the as it evaporated with the hair dryer, it shrunk mm -hmm. back to normal and they reversed it and mm -hmm. he did it yep. he he did it. Dick <laughs> discovered that. Dick Smith discovered that, the godfather of effects, and he did it for this crappy movie called Spasms, mm -hmm. where he just a uh, 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 character gets bitten by some snake monster, I guess, mm -hmm. and yep. and the it's this this dummy head gets pumped full of one one one, and this chemical that makes foam latex swell, and it just swells in real time, and it's really cool looking. Yeah, and so, very naturalistic, yeah, and disturbing, and it's different um, different look than a air bladder for sure. Yeah, you know? and and it and what it does can't be sculpted. It's totally natural, yeah, so it looks yeah. very bizarre. And I think I'm pretty sure that's what what he did with that Palmer head. That's and cool. I think the mechanics. So that 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 photograph that I was so enamored with at Ranger Rick magazine that we've seen that is that body. Um, so yeah, right. it, so it, it was mechanized to move, and then. It, what we're not seeing is like the tubes and stuff that are pumping the liquids because he right. was pumping blood and probably that one, one, one too. Yeah. But, uh, and maybe some air too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some bladders in there. But, but then but, that, um, so that then it, the head splits, which is oh, really. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. You, okay. Let's not jump over my favorite part. Okay. My favorite part is a makeup effect. It would no, I mean, an actor is we're actually wearing a makeup. It's Dave, and I don't know if it's Dave Clennon or what, but he's still tied up, and he's he's whipping his hands. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he stomps on the ground and raises yeah. the, the couch. So cool. Well, that that I so much want to see that makeup because they actually or a mask or whatever it is because I can't quite tell what it is. I mm -hmm. think I think you know the 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 skin is pushed back or something, and the skull is revealed, but it has this kind of weird underslung jaw that was really scary looking uh -huh. but i absolutely love i was talking to a friend about this <laughs> i love that when he's sitting there whipping his hands and his fingers are turned like to these noodles to kind of get loose of the ropes yeah and he's just whipping it around and he and and you can't quite see what the head looks yeah, like yeah 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 but it's really abstract yeah very disturbing and i so much want to see that i know but that's my favorite that's my favorite when he when he's whipping around and he stomps his feet into the ground and lifts the couch up and then he and hits the ceiling. Yeah, that's that so cool. That temp, the temple of that scene was just so good. Oh, so and, and the and the people being tied to the chair next to it is so great. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, give me. A... It's so great. So good. And then so he, good. and then when he drops back down and then he gets goes up to uh, windows is supposed to shoot him with the flamethrower and he just freaks out and and sits there and then the head just. <laughs> <laughs> opens up and then grabs him and then flips him up. I mean, again, these are so Rob, insane yeah. Rob Botine ideas. I'm sure of it. And 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 he's like all slipping. His feet are all slipping the uh, while while he's holding this dummy up. Well, it's flailing. And if I, if I was to be critical, that 
marionette or whatever dummy that kind of yeah, you can kind yeah, of yeah. see that it's a puppet but it's that's okay but it's but i slight. i want you to go back though chet and tell me how you think they did that splitting of the head which by the way i did see that sculpture oh really and it was beautiful yeah wow. it was really really cool so the head that split i saw that sculpture and it was amazing but tell me how you think they got that whipping tentacle to come out um which whipping tentacle? I'm okay, so, so the head splits open. Yeah. And then it's it throws a tentacle out and draws uh windows to its head. Oh right. It goes and around. And it his closes neck, right? on it, and then he's, yeah, he's he can't yeah. get out. Yeah. And, I don't I'm you think it was reverse or was that no, no because the head op- splits open. Yeah, so it couldn't be in reverse. So I was looking at it, I was watching it, and I think what happened is that head only didn't have a back so so the mechanism was only splitting the front part of that sculpture Mm. and and i think someone had a hand maybe that had this tentacle appliance on it right and they whipped it oh interesting and it moved forward towards the camera that's cool and if and if like how clever was that yeah, and if it wasn't yeah. that, then they found another ingenious way of doing that sequence because it wasn't in reverse because of the splitting. Right, of the head. right. And yeah, it, that's and, and all the stuff so is cool. taken for granted now because you just would do it CG CGI now. But it's like the fact but, that they did this, yeah, all on some, camera. It's amazing. Somehow, as a viewer, we feel it. We sense it. Mm-hmm. We sense the time that went into that, and that's what makes it special. And even even how abstract and weird that head was before it split. Yeah. And it just kind of, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's so, beautiful. Yeah, it's so freaky. So I, I have cool. to go back before we finish hit this scene. I have to go back to the dog scene. Cause one of the, 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 the kennel scene, one of my favorite parts of that, that I, that I remember seeing in the theater and being like, Whoa, even, even after the dog stuff was when it shows I think the flashlight, they're putting a flashlight yeah. on it and it's this lumpy mass with all these eyes yeah. blinking and looking around and it rips open Yeah, and that flower thing comes out and it, you could, it seems almost like hands in a glove maybe mm-hmm. and it goes out and then it shoots out and then they switch to that camera shot of, of the camera going towards uh, a child. child's yeah. and it's just like so amazing. Cause it's like, it's, he just, and then he shoots it with the flamethrower. That's that, that, but I just thought that tearing opened with all those layers and the weird flower looking thing. Yeah. I that just being like, that is so disturbing looking. Well, and you know what the flower thing was? It was tongues, dog tongues oh, with little right. teeth on that's it. That's right. Yeah. And it's like, I never, I don't see it that way. And I remember learning that. And even, even it doesn't matter though, because it, it Doesn't looks matter. good, you know, so but, cool. but, but, uh, it's, it's even cooler. It's almost like an Easter egg. Um, and, and that big blob, I mean, it's, it's groaning and you see all those eyes and there's some bladders in there moving and it's pulsating. Yeah. 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 And one of the eyes is kind of spastic and it's, yeah. not, and it, it's so amazing. <laughs> it's so, cool. so cool. And the, yeah, I love, I love how they lit that scene with just the, the lights bouncing. All yeah. Over yeah. It's so, so good. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So the so other good. thing about the, uh, the, um, What's that dude? The stoner guy scene. Oh, Palmer. Palmer. Um, who's also a hilarious character. Uh, totally great. Um, the, 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 you know, we should talk about the, the blood, putting the, the hot wire in the blood. Cause that's another amazing, simple effect where it's a fake uh-huh. hand yeah. and he, and, and like a spring loaded something that pops out of that blood. It's like, that is such a, so effective, mm-hmm. all practical. You mm-hmm. know, when, it, when he finally gets to the, the, with the hot wire to, to, uh, uh Palmer's blood and he kind of goes, <laughs> they show a shot yeah. of him. He's like, <laughs> he knew it's coming. <laughs> Just so funny. Uh, but perfect but, misdirection though. Yeah. Because, yeah, uh, totally. yeah. What's his name? Um, uh, yeah. The Gary starts, you know, bitching and, and, and so that misdirects yeah, the fact that Palmer's the, about to be revealed as a thing and that jump scare. So good. And then the way so the blood good. runs away, it's really cool. Yeah. It's, sque- it's squealing. <laughs> okay, Chet, before I forget, here's a question. Who is the person in shadow that Jed the dog infects at the beginning, do you think? I that's 
I don't, I don't know. Cause th- and it, it might a, be one of those where it's meant to be ambival- uh, 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 vague or... Uh, it's, it, they hired a different actor. Did you know that? It, it, it was Dick Warlock, the stunt Oh, right, right. It, so um, so that you couldn't really tell. I always I always assumed it was um, the dog guy. Uh, oh, uh, 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 yeah, Clark. But Clark, Clark. had a beard. And and I know this. It, I mean, oh, I know right. it's probably. You're right. I know yeah. it's meant to be kind of ambiguous. But I think if you think about it, it was Palmer. Oh wow! Okay. And and Norris, because really the only two people other than Blair that were infected were Palmer and Norris. And and so Norris is interesting because he almost could have been infected particly by a particle it just kind of like grew in him mm-hmm. because he he kind of at one point he's feeling a pain or something he doesn't know what's going on right. and it's, and so but whereas palmer i think was just one of those that was absorbed you know attacked well, in the dark by here's the, the dog the other thing is that you know john carpenter says that there is a at the end there is yeah there is a one of one of them is he, he said there is a there is he, he said he knows whether they're one of them's a thing or not. Yeah, and he and he, yeah. he so and 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 there's the theory that it was Childs, mm-hmm. and you know there is a shot of uh, Childs and uh, Palmer smoking weed, passing. That's a joint, right. Yes, that's right. Which is the saliva. Could have. Now he, yeah, yeah, you and know? he was um, probably infected because Jed got to him. Before that scene, yeah, that's, that's that's the other thing. That dog is amazing. amazing. The performance of that dog is like even, I remember when I was fourteen years old or whatever, mm-hmm. seeing that dog, and it was it's haunting the way mm-hmm. that dog. It's like it, it's 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 amazing the way that dog walks and the way it's like looking out the window. At, at, you know, uh, at that one point it's, it's up, up on the desk and it's just staring out the window and yeah. you're like, is that a dummy dog? It's like so yeah. still. And that's the way it walked. And it just, it, it was, it was like, again, it's one of those things where you could tell everything just kind of came together yeah, artistically because. How know. do you get a dog to open up the door, walk down the, the hallway Look in a room. I know. I go, someone's in here. And, and then slowly go in. And, and Yeah. And it was so deliberate and it just felt oh, like yeah. it didn't seem like a normal dog. And and they said that that was like a, that dog was kind of freaky. It was like half wolf, half dog. And, and, and it, uh, it, it would, you know, the trainer warned him if it gets a weird look in its eyes, it means you yeah. have to back off. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's also that shot of at the beginning when it jumps up on, um, uh, what's his name that got shot mm-hmm. and it jumps up and puts its paws on his chest and there's a close up and it was such a great insert of it, of the, of Jed licking yeah. what's his name's face. Yeah. And, and, maybe, that... and it was, it was almost kind of touching, haunting. Right. Like I said. know, I know, I know. And that's the thing is like that, that guy's like this dog lover, you know, but, but, but he could have gotten infected. He wasn't infected though. That's weird. Cause he licked the, he licked him because yeah. remember he got shot. Yeah, for trying to get McCready with the scalpel, and they did his tested his blood, and it and he wasn't infected. Wasn't infected. So that's yeah. interesting that the dog didn't infect him when it licked him. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but but Jed was yeah ma- one of the best dog performances I think I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 so good. Amazing. So good. And that was a. That's what's also kind of weird is Rob created a static version of Jed that doesn't move. Right. That's a lot of work. Yeah, to do a really good dog <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah, it's it's a lot of work. Um. Okay, so what after that? There's the oh, there's the that that was another weird ass Rob thing mm-hmm. when Wilford Brimley puts his fingers in Gary's face. That's so weird and strange, and it's almost like you know, as with rob effects sometimes it's like is that it's almost like is that how it would really work can you could you do that it's like you know in the same way that in total recall where the, where the head pops up it's like how would that be possible yeah. like but i don't care it's cool it's strange 
uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter because it's credibility, cool. but, yeah. but it doesn't matter. And I think the idea it's is so probably... It's so cool looking too, though. You know, and we have to give Mike Plug credit. He might have introduced some of these ideas in the, the, the storyboard. That's true, yeah. But um, I suspect that was just an added twist, which Rob's so good at, to mm-hmm. just... And he, and, he, and he closed, you know, closed his mouth, keep him from crying out. Yeah, and then yeah, Rob yeah. probably just said, well, let's not stop there. Yeah. Let's, let's insert the fingers it's, into the It's skin. kind of a classic. I mean, I, it stuck out mm-hmm. to me when, when I first saw it. Like, this is, that's weird. It's, it's <laughs> it, you know, it could have just, it could have just been covering his yeah. mouth. But, but to go that extra mile and do it and make it weird, it's like, it just, so and then cool. it gets even weirder. There's that insert of him yeah. dragging Gary away. And it's like, now the skin's like this big bag. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. So cool. But, you know, back real quick, Blair. Blair is one of the most interesting characters, I think, in the movie. Mm-hmm. Because can you imagine at one point, and it's a beautiful scene, and it's when he's, he's he deduces that this thing could t- could kill humanity. Yeah. And and then okay, what does what does a person do at that point? And I remember when I watched the movie and he's going crazy, shooting everything. I, I didn't understand that as a mm-hmm. kid. I was like, what's his problem? You know, I didn't really comprehend it. But right, that's actually totally you would the 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 the, the gravity. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. and the, of a potential nihilistic, you know, a, a, a alien experience, infection. You would just probably go do whatever you could, start well, killing everybody, and go crazy. He's go kind crazy. of gone crazy and snapped, yeah. but he's not wrong in not wrong. You know, just dis- destroying everything. You know, and you know, my one of my favorite little scenes in the movie is when um, when uh, Fuchs uh, and and McCready are out in the helicopter or thigh call or whatever, mm-hmm. and Fuchs reads the. Blair's notes mm-hmm. and the rea- the reality that this thing is still alive. Yeah, yeah, is so wonderful. Yeah, so so sk- sk- bru- Yeah, just foreboding. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it is great. But I was going to ask. This is what I wanted to get to as far as Blair. Not only did Blair realize what they were up against, he gets infected. Mm-hmm. The thing goes up and and gets him while he's in that little tool right shed. yeah yeah think how scary that would be yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's a, mean, that, that does whole... it does it scratch at the door does it yeah knock? Does yeah it, does yeah it, yeah it must it, 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 it i imagine it was palmer or something is palmer, palmer saying we're gonna let you out now yeah he's right because because <laughs> man that that's so many just amazing scenes in this movie they're just not 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 hugely consequential to the overall storytelling, but when they open it up and he's sitting there and there's a noose there (laughs) and he's like, I want to come out. I'm fine. I'm not going to, it's like, that's such a great scene. And he was, he was, he was infected then. So, Oh, was he infected at that point? Cause he said, I think, I think he was, well, I could be wrong. When is it when he goes, it's not Fuchs. It's not Fuchs. Yeah. Yeah. That he's infected then, but right. Can you imagine him sleeping out there, maybe slightly drunk because he's he's drinking vodka, and then to hear Palmer, you know, talk at the door. Yeah, yeah. And how scary that would be. Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't want to open it. Yeah. And uh, and then of course Palmer has Adam in the most brutal way. Ah, jeez. Yeah. That, I, that right there is just to think about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. The other, I thought another amazing thing was the, the, um, Blair building that spacecraft, Mm -hmm. something like, uh, that was freaky to me for some reason, like not seeing it happen and then seeing, yeah, it's like, was he doing it as Blair? Did he grow extra appendages to do all that work? Or did he change to make, cause it's like, how would you build a spaceship like that? Okay. You're a super intelligent creature. Could you do it in the form of a, of Blair or, 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 or did, did he, did it change yeah. as needed to build the thing? 
Yeah. And, and the idea that just, car, you know, how would you carve out all that stuff under the ground as a man? It's like. It, it probably turned into one of the creatures that's, yeah, and that's know, absorbed and that has, you know, cool shovel like claws. That's what I love that though. Yeah. Cause it's, it insinuates all, it implies all that. And it's, and it, and it's creepy, you know, that you don't know. And, uh, I found yeah, that scene right, really kind of creepy that you're right and that's that's kind of what makes Blair's character and and so interesting that is so much of what happens to him is off screen so mm-hmm. not only uh, as a screenwriter it's like boy you're 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 missing out on two great possible sequences to write that of Blair getting infected and then of Blair how would he create the saucer but they chose not to show it which is even better right yeah so you're right yeah yeah uh Okay. And okay. And then we got to talk about the ending sequence because that was something that was kind of screwed up, right? Because they did it in stop motion and they felt uh-huh. like it didn't look good enough or, or something. I mean, they did the, 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 the tentacles at the end are stop motion that look re- pretty mm-hmm. cool. And it grabs the, I love how it grabs the uh, dynamite plunger thing. Yeah. Yeah, that looked good. Yeah, that looked yeah. Really good. I thought it looked really cool. But apparently, they shot, they did like a stop motion version of that Blair monster that mm-hmm. they that they cut out, and so it 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 does feel like, you know, if we're gonna be critical about it, it does feel like that ending is kind of a letdown after all those other amazing effects. I mean, I it's agree. a cool creature, but it's like, you could tell they were, they were, he was working with not enough material to, yes. to, to really showcase that thing. And it's, and you expect it to be more of a, ta-da, you know, uh-huh. and it's kind of not quite, it doesn't, it never bothered me really, but, but cause uh, everything, it's still great. Everything else is so great. But, um, yeah, it was. I wonder what the deal was because Randy, Randall Cook, Randy Cook. Yeah, Randall William Cook, and uh, you know he's did, quite an artist. Did the stop motion and it, yeah, he he sculpted it. Yeah, he sculpted that little puppet, and he's you know he's a good director too. He did that movie I Madman. Oh and yeah, so he's, he's I never one of those that. like Renaissance guys, just real real talent. But I wonder what happened with that because he's like you know he's one of the. Well, like John Carpenter said in the, the movie, he said it just didn't ed- edit together very well. Yeah. Okay. You know, you could tell. Yeah. Despite Randall William Cook and uh, what's her name? Susan Turner, that great model maker who did the ship. Yeah. And, and he did that set. Beautiful. Despite the beautiful work and talent that went into it, it just didn't, didn't quite yeah, didn't mesh work. well. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. I, I wonder if, and I don't think Rob's crew sculpted part of that tentacle, but as the practical effect i think it just zooms in and you just see blair but Mm -hmm. um yeah you're right but have you ever like i'm sure you have but slow motioned or stop framed the dog that comes out no but i know what you're talking about i never i never have slow motion it's a really cool sculpture oh yeah It's, it's like part dinosaur snake and a dog oh that's cool and and one eye is small and then it the other, the right side of it is like this hematoma, this, this eye that's just bulging out oh, man. and it's kind of looking downwards. It is so cool. I, I want to, after we're done, I'm going to watch it again. And go and go freeze through frame the, that. Yeah, yeah. Cause it is, I would, it's a fantastic skull design. Yeah. That is really, cool. That, really really cool. that, that, that's, that, that is cool. And that, you know, Blair with a big yeah. mouth on the side of his head is really cool too. Yeah. And I think Henry Alvarez sculpted that. Wow. Pretty sure. So yeah. So cool. Yeah. And then the, uh, uh, yeah. And, and the, the ending is great with the, with the, I don't know. It's kind of a perfect ending to me. I think so too. Where it's, it's so grim and it's like, you know, they're pretty much going to die. But then again, you're like, there's a tiny bit of hope because you like these characters so much. There's a tiny bit of hope that you're thinking, or at least me, I was like, <laughs> yeah. maybe they would get rescued yeah. somehow, something, someone would see the fire or something, you know, but you pretty much know they're going to die. Um, and it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect it is. for it's the perfect. movie. It's so grim. It's perfect. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, it ends with that nice thumping music by Andy yeah. Marconi. And it's just, oh, it is. It's so good. It's, it. yeah, it didn't try to... Um, 
yeah, I guess the studio, everything, they let it go. They didn't, they didn't try to make it a happy ending. Yeah. It was uncompromisingly bleak. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I just, so, okay. So we talked about the eighties being a kind of non-reality, weird, optimistic time. So, but people, the zeitgeist, there must have been some kind of visceral, re, vis, visceral reaction to such a, a bleak concept of how man can go out mm -hmm. and how that we're, it's a very non-anthropocentric take on humanity and our vulnerabilities. Yeah. Because it's, we could go out, um, and this, this is kind of what the, that HBO series, The Last of Us, kind of mm -hmm. scared me because it's like, yeah, that's plausible. We could go out by a fungus, you know, yeah, pup, infecting right. and puppeteering us. Yeah. And then the thing is kind of a similar, the concept of the thing is kind of similar. It's like, what a horrific way to go. Yeah. But at the same time, it's basically just consuming um, its victims. And that is a part of life. Yeah. A very horrible, horrific part of life, and so I think maybe it just—it was just people, the collective cognitive dissonance was too strong, and they didn't want to see what was very plausible. Right. It's more likely that if an alien visits, it's going to take over and do something horrific than maybe just—it's yeah, like you said, if it's geez. like humans, it's it, that's what will happen, you know. Yeah, it's, we're brutal. Yeah, we're brutal. Yeah, what we do to animals, it's just. It's, it's hideous. Yeah. And so, yeah, if some, if some kind of equivalent came and knocked, bumped us from the food chain, it would be oh, the most horrific of horror shows. Yeah. And you I know, don't, they must not, the people just didn't want to deal with that, I guess. You know? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say there's so many factors on something being successful. But when did Blue Velvet come out? 86. 86. Okay. Because that was during that. Reagan yeah. era and and it, and that's a weird, dark, disturbing movie. It has a kind of a good ending though, kind of a happy ending somewhat. It's surreal though. Yeah, yeah. You, you it's yeah. a lot weirder, but that was a success. That was a successful movie. Okay, I'm so glad you mentioned Blue Velvet because you know, I I vacillate between The Thing and Blue Velvet being my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, so I'm I'm and, with you on Blue Velvet. It's my favorite David Lynch film. Yeah, sure. and it's it's it does something no other movie is 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 quite done. And and I, I'm so glad you mentioned it. So it it came out in eight, the middle of the '80s, smack dab in the middle of the '80s, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it. I'm just saying, I was wondering why... Totally would, unprecedented. Yeah, why would that one be the weirder movie, really? Why would it be successful when something like The Thing was not? And, and also... It video, wasn't. It, it wasn't that successful at first. Oh, was Blue it? Blue Velvet, uh, the the audience reactions were terrible. Ah. And and um, it it kind of just came out to no reaction. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't And realize. even, even, um, even, uh, Dino De Laurentiis who produced it, who says he was like, I don't know how we're going to market this movie. And I guess what happened was, um, <clears throat> Pauline Kale revisited the movie and wrote a very, um, flattering, approving critique of it. Um, and that kind of forced people to kind of reevaluate it. And then it was yeah. re-released or whatever, and it started gaining momentum. Kind of like Halloween was. Hall Halloween was the same way. It just kind of came out to no real reaction, and then it started gaining momentum. And so the thing is like an extreme version of that, right. as opposed to maybe months and maybe a year of getting momentum. Right. It almost took decade, a decade or so. Yeah, I know. And it's still gaining momentum. I and know. so it's... It's amazing. Uh, so that's Blue Velvet and is a good thing to reference because they both kind of did the same things. Um, but it it took time for it to be recognized. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I, you got to wonder how much of it was overshadowed by E.T. as well. And and because E.T. was so huge. Yeah. And, you know, when something's that big in the public consciousness, it, mm -hmm. it directs public consciousness in a way. So totally. you've got people more in that mindset of the happy alien, the warm and fuzzy, 
thing, you know. And it was, and and I love ET. Yeah, it's great. It, it's a great. It, film. I love it. It does. It hasn't aged as well as the thing. Um, oh, I don't really? know if you've seen it recently. No. Um, I I almost cringe at certain scenes. Like there's one sequence where he's getting drunk because ET's raided the fridge and is drinking beers, mm-hmm. and and. Elliot's getting drunk in class and, and and then there's the whole classroom scenes where the frogs are let loose and he kisses the girl. It all seemed kind of poorly written. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of like, what is this? And doesn't <laughs> I was like, it doesn't quite age very well. But there's a magic to E.T. that's undeniable. Yeah. There really is. It's, yeah, it's a, so, great, it's a great film. I haven't seen it in a movie. long time, but yeah. it's it's just it's a it's a classic. But, but I think the thing is better. I yeah, think the thing I know. It's more airtight and i think it has more resonance and and you know aside from the computers the old those old school computers they're using i don't think i don't think you can tell that it's from the 80s aside from those et or the thing the thing Mm -hmm. it doesn't look dated to me at all it's like the it looks beautiful there's because it's like they're they're not fashionable they're not wearing fashionable clothes. It's all utilitarian stuff that you'd wear up in the in the snow, and the buildings aren't, you know, they're 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 yes. military kind of looking. So, they're not over designed. Yeah, and so and, uh, aside from those old computers, it doesn't feel at all like an old movie from the eighties to me. And maybe yeah. it's maybe because I'm like you know immune to that because I grew up watching it. But I was looking for that. I was like. It just didn't feel dated to me. It really felt like it Doesn't. still held up in pretty much all ways, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I another thing of note that just doesn't matter, but it's funny. It's like I always thought those the Norwegians' weird slitty glasses are also <laughs> really creepy. Yeah, um, kind of freaky looking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, those are kind of stylish and designed. Yeah, but, but <laughs> I, they were neat. They're, I um, guess, for snow blindness. You know, it's like even though those were, I'm sure, were like so you can see in the snow or something. Yeah, know? very utilitarian. Yeah, uh, but you know, Chet, what I also appreciate, and it's like Jaws. Steven Spielberg made a point to film Jaws on the actual ocean. John Carpenter made a point to film many of the scenes up in yeah. uh, British Columbia and, and, and in a similar climate. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and what, what do we get? We get these beautiful shots yeah. of just the, the glaciers and the snow and, and the winter sky. And I, I know in LA, that's one of the things when I lived there that I missed the most was just winter skies. Mm-hmm. So like here in Utah, the mountains are just snow covered and, the winter sky when the sun's going down they turn pink mm-hmm. and and the and the blue is like a brilliant um like uh Perry robin's Nicole. egg blue uh. and and it's like so and and the mood of winter clouds and of, of low hanging clouds and mm-hmm. you can see all of that in the thing yeah i love all of those outside shots oh yeah uh, the, do- the compound and the everything. opening with the dog opening is another yeah. amazing opening to a film is that dog running in the snow and the helicopter co- coming yeah. right over it it's so good yeah it's so good the dog even crouching at one point when it, yeah. it comes so low it's like it's so intriguing it immediately pulls you in like what is going on here mm-hmm. you know and then it just doesn't stop that was the other thing it's like i was really trying to keep track of how the pacing was and if there's any spots that felt like they didn't need to be there. And it really didn't feel that way at all to me. It just felt, it seemed like the whole thing just went and kept going and it was a great pace Mm -hmm. throughout. Yeah. Very tight. Kind of flawless, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the screenwriter is the guy who wrote the Bad News Bears. Bill Lancaster. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Burt Lancaster's son. And yeah. I would really like to read that script. Yeah, right. Because I, th- I think in the making of, of the thing, they show a couple pages of it. And even the first few pages, as, as it was describing some of the characters, it was like, it describes McCready something like uh, helicopter pilot, mid-30s, oh, yeah. uh, likes chess. The pay is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something really yeah. succinct, but that's like so, so good. Yeah, that's such yeah. good character writing. Yeah, and uh, I'd yeah. like to read that script. Yeah. Yeah. Credit goes to 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 Bill Lancaster. Everybody. Dean Cundy's lighting. Yeah, the cinematography is uh, amazing. 
John, is it John Lloyd, the production designer? Not like you said, not over designed and just very believable. And and I, I love the mood of, of the compound, you know, yeah. in the like hallway. Said, yeah. The color, stuff. yeah. The color and, and yeah. just the, the, the feel of it is it's, it's perfect. It's like, you know, that's very, all the colors are very grayed. Mm -hmm. Everything's grayed out. You know, if you look at, it's just, it's, it's just really, I don't know if it's the co color grading or the art direction or production design or combination, but it's just like so pleasant to look at, mm -hmm. you know, it just, 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 it feels good to look at it. It's like, and it, and it gives you this weird feeling of kind of in the beginning of sort of a cozy feeling in a weird mm -hmm. way where, you know, they're all kind of hanging out in the rec room and, and uh, I don't know, that's, that, that was, and it's almost like that cozy feeling ends up turning into like this paranoid, scary, claustrophobic, claustrophobic feeling. feeling because you know? yeah, when you're, um, you know, having grown up in Utah and gone up to cabin, our, we, uh, the relatives had a cabin that we'd go up to sometimes in the winter time. And, um, it's, it's a very, it's, it's amazing how you feel when you're up in the mountains surrounded by snow in a cabin Everything uh, is reduced to its most simple parts. Mm -hmm. How do we eat? How do we cook dinner? What are we going to cook dinner? Let's, you know, sleep. And it, and it's very, very satisfying, actually, mm -hmm. to have everything reduced to those basics. Because yeah. when, you, when you figure out what you're going to eat and eat it, uh, you're, you know, that's one thing accomplished. Okay, now we got to deal with sleeping. Are we going to be warm enough? Then we do it, and then that's accomplished. And, it, and it's so... So it's it can be very cozy unless something goes awry yeah. and then you're either you're in trouble. Yeah. And those opening scenes uh, in the thing, especially when you look out the windows, or, you know, you can look out and it's blue or whatever. Yeah, There's that yeah. weird kind of coloring. I know that could have been set, but but Dean Cundy was so smart to be able to put those blues in there. But it it is it is kind of cozy, and then it goes awry. Mm. And and I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like that arc yeah of, of just the environment yeah and so so cool so uh, good so we we got to wrap this up this is going to be the longest episode ever i think pretty soon i mean we're got two and a half hours here coming up on but i i, I want to get a couple other things in though and any anything yeah. that you want to get in but but i want but you know another the the uh the who's the guy that gets shot in the leg yeah that was um bennings bennings Bennings, uh, shoot, hold on. My th this, I'm having dog trouble again. Uh, Benning, Bennings, um, that was in uh, an additional ad additional shot where he gets he gets taken over by the thing. I think it's something they put in later, and it was hmm. just from what I I remember reading this somewhere. It was just a dummy that they made, and, and oh. it was kind of like just off the cuff, put a bunch of tentacles and slime all over. Oh, when but, windows looks at him and he sees yeah, he's being taken and, over. And it's him. so creepy and disturbing for, for something yeah. they just like threw together. Yeah. Uh, that's at least that was my understanding. Even if they didn't just throw it together, it's still really creepy. Cause he's just like, it's weird. <laughs> you could tell it's not a guy. It's like, you know, and I appreciate the use of dummies. Really good dummies are always better to use, to do, to, to do for corpses rather than a person pretending to be a, a pretending to be dead. I was think, it a dummy? Do you think that was a dummy? I think it was a dummy. I think it was, but it, there's it's it's he's got. I mean, tentacles. when the tentacles are pulled, it could have. Yeah, it, it it is. I think it is a dummy. I think it is a dummy. I, I yeah. now I want to look again, but I I'm sure. It, hey, get out of that! God, this dog. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Jump up. Oh. Stay with me. Yeah. So annoying. Um, yeah, I read that it was maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna look now because maybe it was a, a maybe it was an actor, but it's still really disturbing. And then I wanted to mention Barry. his hands, which are like when they when he's running out after that and, and, and it's mm -hmm. it's bannings with those weird hands. Mm -hmm. Again, so simple. It's like he's not done chain transforming and he's got those big, creepy, long, distorted yeah. fingers. And it's like, uh, that was not like some amazing effect. 
some amazing sculpture. It's just like, but it, but it worked. It's, it's simple as I guess is what I'm saying, but it's no, so actually, creepy. I don't mean to contradict you, Chip, but I read Shannon Shea's book and, and James Cummings or something I worked on. It. He said, Jim, Jim Cagle sculpted those. Uh, uh-huh. oh really? And they, and they were, there actually was a concept behind them in that the, the bones, at least on the left hand shot out of the skin. Almost like leaving a sleeve behind. Oh, on the left wow. hand. oh, that's look, cool. You can kind of see. Oh, really? But but the right one, I agree with you. The right one is just looks like a like almost like a tree branch. Yeah, yeah, weird. yeah. That's and I love it because it's so weird and abstract. Yeah. But I know one of them was was the bones just ejecting out of the oh, skin. Oh, that's cool. But but the way yeah. the way it reads are just like like you said, twigs almost like, and it's it, it, it's so disturbing looking with where it's just the hands. I don't know. I found that scene really creepy. I love it. Yeah. And and just and then the music, the sound effects during that scene, and then just the howl that Benny yeah, lets out. Yeah, I know. It's so cool. Oh, man. So good. Yeah. But, great. you know, that's an example. That's why when I think of the thing, I get exhausted because there was a concept behind those Benning's hands, and you hardly even know what yeah, they were. Yeah, right. And so I think that is that is the beauty of Rob is that he'll – he thinks about these things. And and so if he ever makes a making of, in addition to having every conceivable photograph that he has of the thing making of, I would like to hear his, his thoughts. Yeah. You know, I, and his thinking process there, behind it. I, I, I kind of wish there was a better thing documentary because there's that feature, that, that featurette on the, the mm-hmm. DVD bonus feature, which is, it's good. But yeah. yeah. I don't know. It feels more like a featurette than a, than a surreal documentary. You know, it's just them sitting in, on black and yeah, there's not a ton of behind the scenes stuff. No, and, there weren't any like real stuff in the Heartland, universal Heartland yeah. warehouse where they were making all of this. It really needs to be like, you know, cause they're starting to come out with these really good documentaries. Like the, uh, the, uh, there was a, that Friday the 13th documentary. I think it was, Oh yeah, it was like a four hour yeah. or something documentary. And it's, and it's great. Yeah, it's, it's great. Excellent. It's like yeah. I love documentaries like that. And the, the I think there's a Nightmare on Elm Street one and uh, it, there needs to be a thing documentary, man, like like that, you know, really in depth. Oh, the Robocop. There's a pretty good Robocop. Right. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. But still it ah, damn it, Rob, I wish he would have contributed. Was he not to involved? It. No, no. And it, so it's like a major part of that whole movie and he I hope he's doing okay. Yeah. Because may you know, maybe he's become agoraphobic or there's other things. I don't know. Or maybe he doesn't maybe he's he's maybe not he just into, doesn't care. Maybe he's not on. into being in the pub public eye, but I don't know. In, in in interviews he seems so charismatic and kind of built for he that is. sort of thing. Yeah. Really good at speaking and but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I I, I don't know. And uh but it, it's I don't, yeah, I don't want him just to kind of fade away. I, if I anybody really knows him. Rob Bottin who's listening to this, please send Absolutely. him a link. <laughs> tell him to come on the podcast. Tell him to get in touch <laughs> like, he, like he cares. I will give you this dog. Oh. <laughs> Rob. A little baby Jed. <laughs> oh, what a cutie. She's so cute. She's oh annoying gosh. as hell, though. <laughs> She's really cute. Um, yo, one last thing. One last thing. Unless there's other points you want to make. And that is, I found one flaw where they were burning everything to destroy the thing. And they were burning the clothes. What about all those globs of fluid? What about when they blew it? What about when Kurt Russell throws the... What about when they blow blow them up? Mm-hmm. There's got to be little particles that didn't burn all the way. That it would have to burn completely to ash, I would imagine. And that's that does kind of bother me about that scene where uh, uh, Palmer's the thing and he runs outside. It's like just let him burn for a while. Yeah, exactly. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just thinking, is that the scene where he, where he's bur- where he's burning and then he throws the the, the yeah yeah. Cause it's like, okay, he was burning, but now you probably put out a bunch of the flames and now there's now there's particles everywhere, everywhere that are just going to yeah. be frozen, which is like a million little things all around. 
you know, and I think that just adds to how horrific the whole concept is, is that I don't think there's any way you could escape that's, something like that. That's, yeah, I guess that's the, the, a more charitable way to look at it is, is like, it's not a flaw as much as if you really think about it, you realize it was absolutely hope, hopeless from the beginning. The whole thing was pointless in a way, because there's no way if, if, if it survives in saliva or those little blood things that ran away, it's like yeah. they never went and got the blood things. Yeah. That when, when they did the test and the blood ran away, what happened to the little, it's like, yeah. So, so that's the way I choose to look at it. And, like, and, you know, it, yeah, I mean, exactly. At what point does, can one be contaminated? I mean, at what molecular level? I mean, is it fluids? Is it, is it particles in the air? I mean, yeah, right. It, um, or does it have to be chunks? And yeah. I don't know, but it's, <laughs> but I think they were up against an impossible adversary and it was, yeah. Yeah. It was like, it was it was the end of the world at its initial conception. Yes. And even if that even if that's a sc logical script flaw even if you look at it that way it doesn't matter cuz it's such a great film. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It's still perfect and amazing. I was I was thinking and I I mean what if all of them got did get taken over by the thing? How would they? <laughs> how would they get along the rest of the winter? You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Would they, would they retain <laughs> straight straight ahead? Would they retain some of their yeah. uh, their their initial host characteristics, or are they just sitting there, or would they all go sit outside and freeze to death? You know. <laughs> or, yeah. Or would well, that's you know, the, or would they be? They were saying, yeah, that's what they're saying. It's like, if you have, are, if, are, are, do you not know even that you're the thing until it's ready to, it needs to transform, you know, the, 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 all that this actors were saying, they're all kind of discussing yeah. that, you know, the different aspects and, of it. And I think Norris didn't know he was, well, I don't know. It seemed like he didn't because he had he, those chest pains and he was acting like, why yeah. would you have a heart attack unless it was intentional? But then why would you? There was that scene where no one was looking and he's like going like he has heart pains. Yeah. That makes makes it seem like it was well, he, he made it he was a perfect copy and the perfect copy has a heart attack in the in that under that strain. Yeah. That's the way kind of I saw it. So Well, there's that one scene where when when McCready's been locked out of the compound and he's and he's trying to get in and they're all wondering what to do. Yeah. You know, whether to blow him away or let him in or whatnot. And the two that were saying, let's blow him away were Norris and Palmer. Right. So right. It almost could be that you could be infected and almost like a subconscious. Yeah. And say and do things that you're not quite aware that you're doing, but serve that serve your well being. Yeah. That serve your right. survival. And I just I like to think that, yeah, uh Norris wasn't quite conscious of what he was, whereas Palmer was. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's a, that's was, a, another reason the film is such a classic is it really is. It has those, it's, 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 uh, possibilities. Yeah. Threads. Oh, Chad, I, I lost your volume. Tater just knocked the button. What's this little one's name? Is Tater. Hi, Tater. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Listen to him. Listen to his breathing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what a cutie! He is cute. My uh, two cats are zonks. I, I've, I've really seen them. They've been walking oh, back and forth. Have they? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's another <laughs> pet episode. Um. Uh. Oh, I was I was saying that that's kind of also what what another great thing about the movie is um, that it is kind of it, it sparks your imagination and gets you thinking about things. It's there's that yes. element of mystery to it that's really interesting to where you can kind of like really chew on it and think mm -hmm. about all these different aspects of it because it's a cool idea. It is. You know what it's, I mean, it's such a great idea. Yeah. Uh, um, hold on one second. 
Jeez. Dogs. <laughs> Ruining my episode. <laughs> she just took a little... She took a little panel, a painting panel, and is chewing on it. It's like these dogs are so destructive. No! Okay, um... Leave... Hey! Um... Yeah, so I, I guess that's a good stopping point if unless you had any last notes or reflections. I uh I think we got a lot of it. Um I did take some notes. Um I think uh I covered everything I was thinking. I think yeah. come here. Uh, come here. Drop it. Um think, you know, and just uh Credit goes to Stan Winston, too, for, uh, you know, solving that problem. Yeah. So well, of yeah. just having an arm articulate it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That pup, that kennel dog. So that was, yeah. Oh, oh, this is kind of a little insider interesting thing. Um, so, you know, Jim Cagle, uh, and I hate speaking for him. Forgive me, Jim, if I get this wrong. But um, he's, when, when he was working for Stan... It was still kind of a small business. Oh, and, really? Yeah, it was just a handful, maybe even just Jim and Stan um, and a couple crew members. But they would they would go out to rob shop to just, you know, wait, coordinate. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go on. I got nothing like Oh, my God. My kid is here. To pick the girls up and the dogs, so the dogs barking. Okay. Anyway, continue. I'm sorry. Uh, just that that um, Rob, I think uh, was Jim said that after they got through uh, coordinating with Rob and had head, were in the car, that it inspired Stan to enlarge the scale of his business. Oh, really? It, it was um, kind of unprecedented to to for a crew of like twenty, thirty people. That wow. was kind of unprecedented at the time. That's interesting. Yeah, it, so, it was like a effect. Makeup effects was started off like as a, almost like a little cottage industry with people, yeah. individuals with maybe an assistant or two, like Dick Smith doing all that stuff for yeah. The Exorcist was like him and a couple people helping, you know. And it and I think it it, it Jim seemed to uh, relate that it inspired Stan to uh, go to another level. Wow, you know. What a trip. So, yeah, just the, the influence of that movie on so many different levels was really uh, enormous. And, yeah, inspired many, many people. But, but Stan, yeah, did a great job. Yeah. He did a great job as well. Yeah, I was surprised when I, I remember finding out about that. Um, oh, I was wrong about Bill Sturgeon. I told you, did Bill? I thought maybe Bill worked on it. Uh -huh. And he didn't. I was thinking of Aliens. Uh, Bill Sturgeon worked on Aliens. Oh, really? Yeah, but he did work for Rob on something. I can't remember what it was. Oh, I didn't know that. But he did work for Rob on one of the crews on one, on some movie. But uh, anyway, yeah. So well, that was great. Thank you so much for coming on and discussing this. <laughs> I, oh man, that was a it was a geek fest. I love it, man. I love total talking, geek talking fest about this stuff. It's, it's yeah. It's, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm that little kid in my uh, uh, science junior high class again. It's like we're know? we're experts. I'm self conscious. I can be unself conscious yeah. talking about this stuff with you. <laughs> it's like we're experts on this stuff, which yeah. is like this pointless knowledge. Except if you're interested, <laughs> you know. It's like <laughs> we know we were the ones staring, reading the credits of the movies, and figuring out who did what, and yeah. So so. Super well, fun. So yeah, one of my favorite. It is. It's like one of my favorite movies of all time. So to be able to uh, talk about it is is oh so much fun. So well, let's so do thank it again. you. We'll do. There's so many more movies. If if people, I think our Exorcist episode was pretty popular. So if people oh, dig good. it, maybe we could keep doing it as a little special feature of the podcast because I love talking about movies that we love. You know. Oh, I do too. So I'm totally open. So excellent. Yeah. Contact me anytime. So. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, uh, do you have anything you want to promote before we go or anything going on that you want to tell people about or anything? No, no, not 
really. Just uh, just hanging, hanging in Utah. Just hanging, and uh, just nothing too eventful. All so, right. yeah. But well, thank you. Yeah, anytime. All right. <laughs> well, are you doing okay though, as far as uh, your stuff? Have you got any um, showings going coming up soon? Yeah, I got a show in October. Oh, that's great. my solo show. So I'm I'm trying to. Uh, Is it at Copro? Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so I'm, I'm I really want to do since I took a year off. I didn't do a show last year. I want to do something really good. So I'm thinking about enlarging the scale of my paintings. Maybe do some really big ones. Mm. Maybe. Um, and just trying to come up with working on the concept and coming up with a style for the show. So I'm I'm doing Fantastic. that and. and Finish trying to finish commissions and just everything else. I'm always trying to do just stay afloat. <laughs> Keep me posted. I may I need to come out to L.A. At some oh, that'd point. be awesome. That would be a, a great excuse to come out on October and catch your show. That'd be great. So, yeah, Octo- that would... October twelfth is when it is. But I'll, I'll definitely okay. keep you posted. Sounds great. Cool. So. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you everybody for listening. And, and, and yeah. just we just have to say goodbye to the audience. All right. So, goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, John Carpenter. Thank you, John Carpenter. Rob Bo- Botine. Botine. My God. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Everyone who worked on the movie. You uh, did an amazing job. And totally. we appreciate it. And it changed <laughs> our lives. <laughs> sure did. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.